Good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our December 2023 State of the Market. We hope you loved our Taylor Swift as much as we did. That was for That's Rachel, so our right hand woman, our communications awesome. director. She's obsessed with uh, Taylor Swift. And we were listening to it this weekend. And we thought we are in the middle of the woods at midnight on a very cold night. And it's very dark. But spring always follows winter. We always go into the clear. And, so and morning always comes. And so that is our theme for the winter solstice presentation. I mean, that's pretty much the whole presentation, right? We can just, just work. work I mean, like Taylor, yeah. she's just so good. Just mic drop. All right. All right. So welcome, everyone. We're excited to be together tonight. We have our state of the market. We're calling this the winter solstice, where we'll talk about the seasons. For those of you that haven't heard that concept from us before, for those of you that know it, it is always good to have a refresher, always good to be thinking about how it applies to your life, how it applies to the macro economy. And we will describe to you why it is our belief, where you know, we're making the prediction during this state of the market, that we are at the winter solstice. So we're very excited about not only talking about that tonight, but what that means that that spring is coming. And you know, to be clear, we are still deep in winter, but spring is coming. It all spring always follows winter. So super excited about that. I would love to have lots of dialogue in the chat. Something that would be so helpful for Nick and I tonight is to hear your name, where you're from, what you're excited about for 2024, maybe what you're concerned about for 2024, and then what questions you have. And we'll just kind of review those as we go along and make sure as we're doing our presentation that we hit as many of those questions as possible. So go ahead and start popping that into the chat for us there and, and get the conversation going. We do try our best throughout our presentations to answer questions as they come in. Um, so, you know, if you have a question right in the moment, feel free to pop that into chat and then anything that either kind of doesn't fit right in there or we know we might cover in some later slides or those sorts of things, we, we cover that. And then we really do try our best that if there's a question that we didn't get to address throughout the time, we just stay at the end and answer questions. We really want this to be, you know, delivering to you exactly what you want and need so that you can have an amazing 2024. We'd love to see a question from, from everyone. So right now, whatever you're doing, just go ahead and pop a question in the chat just so we get an idea of kind of what you're you know, what you're looking for. We have a pretty good uh, agenda, action packed agenda. But, you know, if everyone had a question about CPI or about single family homes or whatever, we'll make sure that, you know, we, we really focus on the thing that is of popular interest. That's the advantage of being here live on the call versus just watching recording is uh, you get your question answered live on the air. And you get to hear the Taylor Swift song because it's copyrighted. We couldn't right. record that part. Huge advantage. So for those of you watching the recording, listen to In the Woods by Taylor Swift to get yourself in the zone. And then let's dive into these slides. Here we go together. All right. We are online. So the winter solstice, state of the market for December 2023. Our usual disclaimer, um, we are investors. This is the information that we're using that have guided our investment decisions over the last several years and the information that we intend to use to guide our own personal investment decisions for 2024 and beyond. We do have investment offerings. This is not a solicitation to sell securities. That would be part of our official launch webinar when Fund 3 opens. You can think of tonight as an educational entertainment event where we're just all fellow investors getting together talking about the real estate market. A little bit about us. So this is uh, my wife, Dr. Elaine Stogaberg. I'm Nick Stogaberg. Uh, we own Black Swan Real Estate, which is a real estate private equity firm with about a third of a billion in assets under management. Very vertically integrated. We've got about 50 employees here in Rochester and uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, and 30 in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, we've got an uh, incredible real estate sales team at about 75 million in real estate sales last year. We're in the top one third of one percent of real estate sales teams at Keller Williams. Uh, I got to go hang out with Gary Keller at his personal ranch here in the last month. So that was kind of a, a bucket list item there, a perk of being a, a top team at, uh, at Keller Williams. Uh, we've raised about $60 million in, in capital. We've got about $30 million on our wait list for our next uh, fund. I'm sure Rachel can throw a link to uh, the wait list, our next fund there in chat from time to time. Uh, and we do a little bit of ground up construction as well. We've got a $40 million ground up construction uh, project that's uh, in, in progress right now. And we're not saying those things to brag, just to, you know, Give you a few data points to understand why uh, you know we're speaking from a place of authority. Uh, in fact, in just a moment, we're going to check to see how we did last year on our predictions. So hopefully, that can that can you know, you be the judge about about our authority. But it's something that we do quite a bit that we've been doing for a very long time and we've been very successful at. And usually, we're pretty good uh, in our our predictions of the future. 
an astute observer, I haven't even talked about this with you, but an astute observer will notice that these numbers have been, you know, quite stagnant through 2023. Yeah. 2023 was, you know, a, a tough year for many in real estate for us. It was, you know, winter because of the overall economy, which we'll talk about internally. We had a season of summer. We have some slides on that describing what we did to make good use of this time where we haven't had as many acquisitions. We haven't represented as many buyers and sellers in just the general real estate market. So there's still lots of growth happening. It's the optimization and maximization phase of the business. But you may be feeling in your own real estate portfolio, some stagnation in your growth. And that's okay. You want to grow at the appropriate times and then do other things during other seasons. And so it's okay to have a rest period during winter and to follow the seasons. And you'll see that, you know, right in our numbers that this is basically the same slide we've been presenting for the last year. Patience is a posture of humility. Patience is a posture of humility. And even though we didn't get anything under contract this whole year, we've got $30 million sitting on our wait list for our next fund. It's very easy for us to, to have a humble heart and just say, you know, now's not the time. We, we're writing offers. We're not getting accepted because we want to be really tight, really conservative. And, uh, and that's okay. Uh, patience is a posture of humility. Absolutely. One thing we wanted to start with, I love that Nick called this the public service announcement. We're always talking throughout the day and the, the days leading up to any time we do a presentation, but particularly state of the market, it's, it's really one of our favorites about you know, how can we be you know, the best leaders that we can possibly be? How can we give people the information that they need to make sound decisions, to you know, move their investments forward, but also to feel very empowered? And you want to feel empowered regardless of what part of the market cycle you're in. And there's different sort of thoughts or behaviors that are needed during different times, right? When you know, there were 50 offers on a single home all within the first several hours. I mean, it was literally like you had to offer your firstborn to even you know, get a chance to to show the house. That's a very different set of thought processes and mindset that are needed for where the market is today. And so the market, the kind of the mindset that, that we encourage during this time is that truly like none of this macroeconomic stuff is really that important. It's a lot of fun to think about. It's really creative to think about. The more capital you're placing, the more important these concepts are. So if you know, you're placing a lot of capital, if you're say a GP raising money from LPs, this information is probably more important. But if you're say buying single family homes or you know, small multifamilies or even medium sized multifamilies in your local area, those sorts of things, a lot of this stuff isn't that important because of these things. The riches are in the niches. Fortunes are made by fixing market inefficiencies. So we'll talk about what that means. We're big, big, big believers that real estate is hyper local. Real estate is hyper local. So if someone is investing, you know, buying a few houses kind of all across the country, they will likely have less good outcomes than someone who's focusing on a specific area where you have area knowledge and you know, hey, this is where the new school is going in and over here's the new park and eh, this street, you know, things kind of get a little hairy, but this street, things are great. Real estate is a very inefficient market, especially at single family home level. So what that means is an efficient market, things transact at exactly the price that they're meant to transact very smoothly. You can think of that as maybe like the stock market, the stock market, the bond market, the futures market, right? There's literally hundreds or thousands of people every day making the market. That's their job. They're market makers buying and selling these things on trade floors. That's not how it is for real estate. Real estate is becoming more efficient as capitalism matures, but real estate is incredibly inefficient. There's always a reason why someone is selling a piece of property, whether it's a single family home that they lived in their whole lives, an apartment building that they've owned for a year, they're solving a problem. Maybe they need to sell for money. Maybe they need to sell because they're moving or they've had a marriage, a baby, a divorce, a job relocation, you know, all of the things that happen to human lives. This is why real estate was considered to be a critical function during COVID because regardless of what's happening in COVID and pandemics, people need to move to you know, meet their family's needs, their economic needs. And so you can make use of the inefficiencies in the real estate market by solving a problem 
adding value and taking action and doing it, knowing that there's inefficiencies in the market. You want to find that seller that has to sell because they're moving across country and they don't have the capital to get a second mortgage wherever they're going. But, you know, home ownership is really important to them. So they need to sell this home to free up their credit to buy that home. Right. You see how that's an inefficiency in the market versus like a bond trader on a floor. And you can add value to that person's life that may not always be the top line price. Maybe it's that you can close faster, close whenever they want. Um not have um, inspections, you know, whatever it is, you can add value to that transaction in things besides price. Nailed it. Thank you. Yeah. I thought that was fun. Um, this is a, a cute little um, chat I had with a, a friend and, and Black Swan investor, like literally just a few minutes ago. You can see the timestamp is 7.05. So she sent me, for, for those of you that are kind of listening podcast style, she's in the, the gray boxes. I'm in the like cream colored boxes. Real estate being a local phenomenon as well. Just saw this sold for 200000 plus over asking while well, rates are 7%. And then there's a link there for Redfin. It was like a million dollar home outside of Philadelphia. Insanity continues here in Philadelphia suburbs as people flee the city I thought I would share and I said wow thank you so much this is what I just sent to Nick a few hours ago let's make sure there's a slide that says that all of this is subject to area knowledge and that solving problems in an inefficient market is the most important skill that someone can have regardless of what is happening in the macro economy so that's your like little bit of like behind the scenes look into how our slides come together but I hope this is a really empowering message for you that you enjoy tonight you learn you figure out how you can apply this to your investment thesis but you also recognize that the most empowering thing you can do in your investment journey is solve problems in an, in an inefficient market by adding value and taking action we're in the depth of winter that's not a reason to not take action Absolutely. Yeah. So let's start with the end in mind. Uh, when we're done at the end of tonight, we want you to have absolute certainty about where we are today, the, the royal we, the, the United States, the housing market, uh, where we're going and uh, what Black Swan's doing and what you need to do to survive and thrive. We want you to have absolute certainty about that. Uh, we're, we always marvel about you know, people like Gary Keller, where year after year after year, we listen to Gary speak and Gary will make predictions about the future. And we're like, gosh, how... How can he always be so right? How can he nail it? Well, you just have to hone that skill. You just have to hone that skill and you have to be very specific in the types of predictions that you make. Uh, we're going to you know, do that for you tonight and, and be very mindful of not just what we're predicting, but the exact types of predictions that we're making. We're going to we're speak to that when we get to a few slides and how you can really apply this in your real estate journey. But before we do that, let's, dun, do, dun, dun. let's do the drum roll, see where we... Uh, we, we really need here. Taylor here. Play oh, the yeah. music for us. It's too bad that's copyright. We, can't, we can't, can't put it on YouTube. Right. Here we are. So this is in our state of the market that we did. I believe it was Rachel. When did we last do state of the market? Rachel, no, November 2022. Was it November 2022? Okay, that's what I was thinking. Well, 13 months ago. Um, you can find it on YouTube. And yeah. you, you can listen to you can listen to our predictions. So here they are. So we said global energy markets would start to stabilize. If you remember, the Ukraine war was uh, was more of a novel thing back then. It's, it's discouraging to think about it, but we're you know going into like our third year of that war. And uh, the energy markets were all over the place. We were drawing down the strategic oil reserves. Oil prices were high. That was really pushing inflation. And so we made the bold prediction that the energy market would start to stabilize, and it did. Uh, we are no longer drawing down the strategic petroleum reserve, and uh, and and you know, Oil is downright cheap right this second. Our second prediction was that the China COVID lockdown would finally start to ease. This was a, a pretty bold prediction back then. So you might have seen you know, front page of CNN, people dying in their apartments that would catch fire and, and the government would come in and like nail boards to your doors and windows to like lock you into your apartment. Uh, it was it was extreme, extreme, extreme lockdown in China. And we predicted that those uh, those lockdowns would would ease. And uh, that, that, that's exactly how it played out in, in dramatic fashion. We predicted that unemployment would go up. Uh, it did. We said that U.S. inflation would start to ease. We, we were going to have a slide on that uh, here shortly. Uh, it did. Uh, we said there'd be clarity on where interest rates would top out. That was actually a question from Scott Barber. And uh, I think there is extreme clarity. And, and we're actually going to show you that here in a chart uh, a little bit later on. His question was looking to understand where rates are likely to be through 2024 and the anticipated bottom. We have several slides for that. Excellent question, Scott. And then another bold prediction was that treasury rates would start coming down towards the end of 2023, which seemed pretty crazy back then. And that is exactly what has happened here in the last month or so. So we batted 100% on those predictions for the economy. Incredible. 
uh, what would happen with the single family home market. We said few new listings, low inventory persists. A lot of time, a lot of people back then were thinking that, you know, maybe the sky was going to start falling. The, the market would be inundated with short term rentals that people were trying to bail out of. Uh, none of that happened. We said the transaction volume would slow way down. It did, 30 to 40% nationally. Uh, we said prices would decline, but not by much, which again was kind of counter to uh, culture at the time. And that's exactly what's happened. We said no wave of foreclosures. That was uh, another thing that was probably one of the most popular questions we got on last year's State of the Market is, is there going to be an 08 style uh, wave of foreclosures? We said no, there wasn't. Uh, many real estate agents and broker brokerages would exit the business. Uh, we are seeing that firsthand uh, right this second. And some regions impacted by uh, more than others. So we're batting 100% on uh, on that those predictions as well. And finally, what will happen with multifamily? This was the most complex set of predictions. So uh, operators who obtained variable rate debt would suffer. Uh, more distressed assets would slowly come on the market. That is exactly what happened. People expected there'd be kind of a wave of distressed listings to hit the market in 2023. We did not think that was going to happen. And uh, it didn't. Uh, Non-recourse bridge loan providers will repo assets. Uh, earlier in the year, we shared some, you know, you know, was, uh, I think the largest foreclosure in U.S. history, a quarter of a billion dollar foreclosure. Uh, rent growth will slow down, stop. That is exactly what happened. Lost lease will, lease will catch up. That's exactly what happened. Low inventory. That's right. Transaction volume slows way down, mm -hmm. went down 50 to 90 percent. Prices don't decline. Nick much. and I are bored for the first time in our lives. Yeah, <laughs> that, is, that is the case. Uh, prices don't decline much more than they have already. That is exactly what happened. Uh, many people in space will exit the business. We are, again, seeing that firsthand. Some regions impacted more than others. So I would say we betted 100% on 23 out of 23 predictions. Now, now look at these predictions very carefully. So we said, uh, for example, that uh, there will be low inventory. Now, you could say, well, you didn't say what the inventory number would be. Well, that's going to vary region to region. That's, that's an impossible prediction to make. And you need to make sure that you don't fall prey to the, the logical fallacy of mistaking specificity for accuracy. Never make mistake specificity for accuracy. A lot of people like say, oh, we see a 7% increase in XYZ you know, coming. Well, that makes you think that it's accurate. It's not. The most anyone can ever say is you know, something that's uh, you know, general, like transaction volume slows way down. But you can you can bank on that when you know exactly what you're predicting. So would it be a good year or a bad year to go call tens of millions of dollars of capital in a private equity fund when you're thinking that transaction volume is going to slow way down? That would be very bad. That would be a, because a it would terrible be sitting in the bank. That, that's exactly right. So that's why we fired up this wait list. We've worked our hearts out to raise capital, but we haven't called that capital because we know that that volume is coming, but it wasn't going to happen this year. So look really carefully at the predictions you see this year and, uh, and, and, and act accordingly. You can kind of think like they're all um, like, like volume knobs, you know, that we're kind of saying like this volume's high, this volume's medium, this volume's low. And that tells you kind of the song that's playing. And that gives you some sense of how you should move in that market. I just made all of that up and I'm really pleased with good. it. <laughs> how are you going to move? It's, it's, the, it's the Taylor energy pour, pouring over. All right, let's talk about seasons. seasons. Um, this is really like truly one of our favorite concepts, applies to all areas of your life. Investing is just one way that you can apply this concept to your life. And really understanding the seasons is about understanding the layers of who you are as a person, who you are biologically, where you are in say like your career or your marriage or child rearing or taking care of parents. Those are some of the you know major things, major seasonal arcs that people go through, um, what your local market is experiencing, what the U.S. market is experiencing, the, the worldwide market, and then kind of understanding, again, kind of like all of those dials, you can kind of think of those as like circular dials moving from spring to winter. And when you get some sense of kind of setting them all, then you see a pattern and you generally know how to make decisions within that pattern. So that's that's a big part of the reason why we like talking about seasons so much. We like teaching about it. We talk about it with our team all the time. We talk about it internally. And so let's talk about why we think we are in winter. So you know, this is the, the um, piece of art that we have in our office. I'm so excited about our oh, year we, end. We forgot to put it up. Wait, I think it's, we it's put it up. It's a surprise. Oh, yes. Okay. You have a surprise coming, a, a season's surprise if you're one of our investors. We're super excited about that. Oh, okay. So spring. So we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Many of you have heard this. If you haven't, it, you know, it just follows the, the natural things that you learned about all the way back in preschool. Spring is a time of planting, planning. You know, you can just sort of like feel the, the buzz of energy in the air when you say the word spring. Everything is new. Everything feels exciting. The days are getting longer. The birds 
birds are chirping. There's a lot of growth in spring, both in terms of speed and volume. Summer always follows spring. Summer is a time that you're working your heart out. You ask, where's my crop? I like to share the story because it, it really solidifies for me, you know, what summer is all about. We're really fortunate that we live in Minnesota where these four seasons are very pronounced. So we get to experience them with our bodies every single year. And I, we drive past a field on our way home and inevitably in like the third or the fourth week of June, I start to like look at it and you know, wonder, like, did they plant the field this year? Are they, you know, are they letting the field rest this year? And then the first week of July, everything you know, pops up, it grows very, very quickly. That's the feeling of summer of like, it's hot, you're wiping your brow, the days are long, you're working all day. And you're wondering, is growth actually happening? Is, is anything, you know, spring, everything felt so new and fresh and the birds were chirping. And summer, like the sun is hot and the days are long, but I don't, necessarily feel a lot of progress, but all of those things are happening, you know, in those plants, so to speak. And then fall, fall follows summer. Fall is a time of harvest, of abundance. It feels like everything's successful. There's festivals, there's, um, you know, reaping, there's, you know, bringing together apples and all of the, you know, plants and goods and everything together. There's a time of, you know, great abundance, great success. However, if you fail to plant in spring, or if you didn't work in the summer, fall can be pretty scary because while everyone else is celebrating the abundance, there can be a sense of counting, of wondering, you know, will I have enough to make it through this winter? Um, and so that's kind of in spring and summer, everyone's sort of following similar patterns and then fall and winter, people diverge based on what they did in spring or summer. Everyone following, agree with this thesis? Feels like this, this makes Perfect sense. Concept. This is, it's, it's so simple, but then once you really understand it, it's just this really powerful lens about which to understand the world. We learned this from our mentor, Tony Robbins, and you know, he describes that, you know, think about humanity and the, the history of humanity. When we learned the seasons and we figured out, oh, if we plant this little thing, this little seed at this time of year, something good comes of it, right? But if we planted it and say winter, nothing good came of that. So when we mastered the seasons, everything changed for the whole arc of humanity. And that's why this concept is so central to our behavior in all the different areas of our lives. Let's talk about winter. Winter always follows fall. When you're in time of winter, you think, well, of course I am because, because fall was just a few months ago and spring always follows winter, just like the day follows night. Uh, winter does not last forever. Some are long, some are short, some are cold, some are mild winters. Some people freeze to death. That is the, that's the, the purpose of winter. It is to instigate you know, survival of the fittest in nature and, and to, to refresh the, the ecosystem. Uh, but not everyone suffers in winter. Some people store up a harvest. They get to hang out and lodge with their friends and family. They get to ski and snowboard. Uh, and most critically, winter is the best season to grow because that's the time when everything else uh, pulls back. Uh, if if everyone is uh, is you know stopped advertising in, in your market, mm -hmm. that's the time to, to advertise. It's time to grow your business. If no one else is buying, that's the time when you want to buy. And it's a little counterintuitive, but winter is the best time to grow. And so let's just take a poll right now. What season is the U.S. economy in right now? What season is the U.S. real estate market in with this newfound understanding you have of seasons? Winter. Well, I, I hear someone saying winter. That was on our very first slide. <laughs> we are. We are in the in the woods in the dark uh, at midnight at, at midnight in the winter solstice. We can actually get a lot more specific than this. this. Is the concept of the economic clock? So if you're you know listening to this as a podcast, I encourage you to 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 pull up your screen right now. Um, so just take a look at this clock and put in chat where on the clock, what number position do you think we are on the clock? This is not rocket science, and yet the vast majority of people they they don't have mastery of this concept. You can literally at any given time just check where are we on the clock. This is a this is an old concept, a, a simple concept, and yet a concept that just a few people like say Warren Buffett really master, and other people uh, they they tend to forget. I I, I hear a five, yep. I hear a seven. Yep. Okay. Yeah. This is this is something you know. Take take a picture of this with your cell phone. Screenshot your screen. You know whatever it is. Take this home and use this. This is it. It's the 
the magnificence of this is in the simplicity. And, you know, there, I don't want to just necessarily read this, but just, you know, take a look at it, read each thing and you can feel it and remember, you know, start at noon and remember, oh, rising real estate prices. I remember what that felt like. I remember it so vividly. I remember the first time we went over a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars and, you know, and now we buy it 350, yeah. right. Yep. Um, rising interest rates, falling commodity prices, right. Just like think through these things and you'll feel it tighter money. Is it five o'clock falling real estate prices? Is it six o'clock? And this is that, you know, thing where Nick's talking about like the elegance of Warren Buffett or Gary Keller, or these people that you know, sort of seem like geniuses, they just understand the seasons and they understand the clock. And so you can make very good predictions about what behavior will follow. So I I think it's actually really easy to pick out exactly where we are on the clock and the, the fed telegraphs it right so oh, we have someone very specific we have a 6 30 6 30 we have a skipping seven will be or skipping six will be at seven that's pretty good i like that that's pretty good yeah. so the fed telegraphs it right now are interest rates going up are interest rates going down or are interest rates steady right this second feel free to pipe it into chat flat. interest rates are flat that's yeah. exactly right so uh, interest rates are rising at five o'clock. Interest rates are declining at seven o'clock, which means we are at six o'clock. We're at six o'clock on the economic clock, which means we are at the winter solstice. So you can see how with absolute certainty, we can say we're at the winter solstice. And the funny thing is uh, there's an expression, never bet against the Fed. The Fed is a self-reinforcing prophecy because they can kind of manipulate economic conditions. Everyone looks at the Fed to say, oh, wh- where are we on the clock? Okay, the Fed says we're at a we're at a steady interest rate. Okay, so we're at six o'clock. Oh, the, the rates are coming down. We're at seven o'clock. Um, so it's, it's very easy to figure out where the clock is. You can almost just look at the top three headlines on CNN Business and know where we are on the clock. We're at six o'clock right now. We're at the winter solstice. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about some of the um, indicators in the overall economy that are happening at the winter solstice. So CPI is the consumer price index. That's basically a bucket of goods that a person needs to survive in general life. CPI is down from 7.7 to 3.2 in the last 12 months. I personally feel like when CPI was going up, it was all over the news. It was on you know all of the TVs, all of the newspapers, all of the blogs, all of the things. CPI coming down has been very quiet, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. And I think it's you know it's it's important to remember our own human psychology. And it doesn't make us you know bad people or whatever. It's just understanding the beings that that we are. We have patterns about ourselves. And we we love to think about doom and gloom, but we don't often think about when things are getting better. And so it could be pretty easy to miss that CPI has, you know, it is more than cut in half over the last 12 months. And that's really good because CPI erodes middle class buying power, erodes lifestyle. And that's the whole reason why the Fed has been so aggressively raising rates for the last year. So understanding that CPI is coming down means that what the Fed is doing has been working. There's also other factors that have come into play in terms of shipping and China and um, access to raw goods, access to labor, those sorts of things. But this is really critical to understand CPI and what that means for real estate. So let's talk a little bit about the the cadence of the clock, how, how fast that clock ticks. And you might ask yourself, why does Jerome Powell keep talking about raising rates? We, we Jerome just, Powell is the chairman of the Fed. That's right. We just said rates are flat. So why the heck does Jerome keep talking about raising rates? That's because it is better for the Fed to err on the side of being kind of too strict. Uh, you want to, you can, it's, it's okay if the strict dad is nice from time to time. But if the uh, easygoing dad is all of a sudden harsh, that that expectation reset can be a a challenging thing for for markets to understand and and for people to emotionally internalize. So here's just a few things that you need to know about the Fed. And and as you see, you imagine the hands going around the clock. It's not a uniform speed. So the Fed is Mm -hmm. always late and they always overdo it. The Fed is always late and they always overdo it. The Fed is very smart. They're not they're not they're not foolish, just they need time to get data to make sure they're making a good decision, which means that they always have to act later than it seems like they ought to. And then they have to kind of play catch up. So rates have gone up faster than they have ever. Mm-hmm. Rates have gone up faster than they ever, ever have, which means they were late to hikes. So they had to overdo it. They were late to pause, I would argue. I think they probably hiked rates a little too high, but they had to because, again, they, they need to be kind of overly strict on these on these rates to make sure inflation doesn't run away. That also means that they're going to be 
late to cut. They're going to be late to cut. They're going to cut a little bit later than you think they will. But when they do, it will happen faster than you think. And you have to say these things. These are public service announcements because people forget every economic cycle. But these are the rules, and they're the same rules, and they've been the same for the last you know, 100 years. And once you understand these rules, all of a sudden, it's very easy to, to understand how to predict the future. This is a really good one to, mm -hmm. to look at on your screen if you're you know in a safe place to do so you're not driving or that sort of thing. So this is the federal funds rate that was just on the last slide. We've shown this many times because it's critical to get these lessons into your bones so that you can just recall these things effortlessly to understand these patterns. The thing that we want to focus on here is what you know what Nick just said that this was the the fastest rate hike ever. So it you know kind of took everyone by surprise. I certainly feel like there have been more things than seems proportional that are once in a lifetime things in the last three to five years. They're such good headlines. Well, um, you know, I wonder if it's chance. I wonder if it's, you know, because of the pandemic, I wonder if it's just the pace of change is moving so quickly that this is now the new normal, that these once in a lifetime or once in a hundred year things Turns out they're going to happen faster. I don't know. Maybe I'll you know be able to make some predictions around that in the next several years, but it's certainly something that I'm thinking about. That was a bit of a tangent. What we want you to focus on here is when rates go down, here, I'll put my, my cursor over here. When rates go down, they go down really fast. They right? go down fast. Imagine, Does everyone see that? Imagine you're skiing down this hill, 1970, boom, 1975, boom. Uh, this is probably like 1980, boom. You know, and they're kind of bouncing around here. The Fed's trying to figure out what to do in the early 1980s when rates were, you know, the highest that they've ever been. So they're going up and down very quickly. Does everyone but, see that on their chart right now? This is a crucial like, insight. They go up slow and then down really fast. The, the downs are, you know, save for this one in kind of, you know, right around 1990, the downs are almost straight down. So we can expect that the down this time will be a sharp decline. And then the other thing that we have here is what's called the dot plot. So the Fed is made up of a group of members called the Fed the governors, and they each have a little vote here. That's their dots. And this talks about where they predict interest rates will be. And you can see that it there's there's not a consensus over the next couple of years, but things stabilize. I'm sure you want to comment more on this. So if you ever want to know where where interest rates are going to go, um, don't ask the Fed because they don't know. And I love their transparency. The United States uh, financial management system is the, the strongest financial management system on earth, and it achieves this through transparency. We, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but we can make some really good educated guesses. When you look at this, this dot plot here, each dot is a vote from one of the governors, and, and these the, they do vote. They need to vote. Do we want to raise rates or lower rates? So you can look at this chart, and you can say with, with absolute certainty, because these are the people who set policy, that next year rates are going to be lower. R rates are going to be lower next year. If you look, there's a you know a, a very tight correlation around you know five five and a half percent for this year, and for next year, it's around... 5.0, somewhere in that territory. Uh, the following year, about 4.0. The following year, maybe 3.0. And then here's the most fascinating thing of all. Do you see how there's a bigger spread in the dots? Ooh. in 20, Sorry, I was in, trying to be helpful. There's a bigger spread in the dots in 2025 than there is in 2027 or, or long-term. Isn't that fascinating? Because they say, you know, historically, we know that like this is a good equilibrium rate. So there's going to be some unforeseen events that happen in the next few years. Rates could go up, rates could go down. But over the long haul, Here's where they're going to be. It is a superpower when you have more predictive accuracy for events in the far future than the close future. And there are many things in life that you can more accurately predict in the far future than the close future. And government interest rates are one of these things. So we can you know, tell you with, with like absolute certainty approximately what's going to happen with interest rates because the Fed tells us. They publish it with complete and utter transparency. Just go Google like Fed.plot. It's not every meeting. I think it's every other meeting they publish it. And just see what's on their mind. These are the people that set the rates and they're incredibly you know, transparent about it. Um, Victoria asked a, a really good question. I might be too rigid. How are we at six if real estate prices haven't dropped yet in my local market, or should we be looking at more national trends? That is an excellent question. So it is our belief that you know real residential real estate typically is lumped together with both single family homes and large multifamily, but the two markets have split 
because of the way debt is placed on single family homes. It's typically 30 year fixed debt, you know, conventional mortgages. Whereas in the, especially in the last several years, there's been a slew of variable rate debt. So we'll get to that as the slides go on. We have a whole section for single family and a whole section for multifamily. But, you know, years ago, we thought of residential real estate as like all one market. And in, in the last several years, we've split how we think about uh, residential real estate. And that's why prices haven't dropped in most markets for single family homes. So we'll get into that. But that was a, an excellent question. I wanted Victoria, to chat about there. I would ask you a quality question. What if prices already have dropped in your market? What if prices already have dropped in your market? Something for you to think about that might inform your investment thesis. All right, let's talk about unemployment uh, and and just, just overall employment workforce participation. This is going to be uh, the number one or number two driver for where CPI, inflation, interest rates are going to go in the in the foreseeable future. So we made kind of a bold prediction. Oh, shoot, we're 24 for 24. As I didn't. I did not include this in the in the count. Uh, we predicted there'd be a sharp and likely permanent contraction in the labor market. We, you know, we we kind of threw this out there years ago when the pandemic hit. So this is a chart of job openings versus unemployed people. Unemployed is green. Job openings is uh, yellow. So once upon a time there was this equilibrium where there'd be like two to three job uh, uh, candidates for every opening, and then it flipped. And then it flips. See how the the yellow line is 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 it's taller than the teal line. It's likely that this is a permanent change. They could flip around, but as the American workforce gets older, we do have a really healthy young immigrant population that really fuels our economy. But um, you know, as as jobs come on shore, lot, lots of things are are changing in our labor market. It's very likely that this is a, a permanent shift that's that's happening. You can see it. It kind of just barely happened right before COVID, and then COVID really accelerated and accentuated that trend. And there's a, a second thing that interfaces with this, and this is the reshoring movement in the United States. Take this a look is Nick's favorite slide ever. Uh, this is the second favorite one, but yeah. This is... Okay, this is your favorite slide title ever. <laughs> you might say is vertically integrating, baby. Um, in 2006, I worked in a call center for Dell. Dell led the charge in offshoring jobs. They, you know, when you, you pick up the phone and try to get tech support and you get someone who doesn't speak English very well and you're frustrated, they led the charge with that in the 90s. They were some of the first people to do it. And they did that for about 10, 15 years. And then they figured out, wow, you know what? This actually doesn't work. It looks really good in a spreadsheet, but it doesn't work in person or it doesn't work in real life rather because we provide terrible customer service. We lose customers. We lose upsell opportunities. So I had, a, I had one of the first reshore jobs in the United States. In 2010, there were only 5,700 reshored manufacturing jobs. In 2010, there were only 5,700 jobs. In 2023, there are 2 million. The big spread. Just try to wrap your brain around that. So in 2023, a U.S.-based manufacturing uh, executive study uh, performed by Forbes uh, and Zogby found that 82% of executives uh, polled said they'd either moved overseas factories back to the United States or they were in the process of doing so. This is an insane trend. This is literally our entire economy running in the opposite direction of everything that's happened since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Everything that you think you know about how the U.S. economy works is changing. It's changing really fast. Now, let's look at the flip side of this coin. Look at this chart. Try to wrap your brain with, uh, like, what does this feel like to be a citizen in China right now? So your whole life, billions, trillions of dollars have washed up on your shores. You see an entire city spring out of the ground in a couple of years. It took a century for that city to be, to be built in the United States. There's been more prosperity every single year, and it's been fueled largely by debt because more money keeps showing up every day. And then one day, one year, you go from plus 100 billion from your second best year ever to negative for the first time in history. Imagine the whiplash. Imagine the 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 despair that the average person on the street feels. The youth unemployment rate, the, the Chinese government stopped reporting it because it was so bad. This is what war looks like. This chart is what war looks like. What happens when you you give someone nothing to lose? When there's billions of dollars fleeing their country every single year, at some point they say, well, you know, what, what's the point in playing ball anymore? So this is a powerful thing. This is a, this is slightly esoteric, but let's let's bring it home. Let's talk about how this is so incredibly salient to what to what your everyday life is going to look like in the next few years. So if you're waiting on something, it may never show up. 
that last slide is costing us. It's costing Elaine and I, I'm going to say about $500,000 at one of our properties alone because we ordered an electrical main service panel two years ago. Mm -hmm. We don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. And we tried to change some things around. And then we talked to the utility company about, okay, if we change these things. And the utility company said, oh, sorry, we're back ordered on transformers. So little old Nick and Elaine, we can't get a you know panel, no big deal. But when our utility provider for our entire region says we can't get transformers, so what's the lead time on that? We're not sure. We're not sure. Do you guys feel that in in your your day to day lives? I know you know I'm in my late 30s. Nick just turned 40 this year, and I certainly think of our entire lives as a time when you know everything just became cheaper, right? Socks became cheaper, clothing, electronics, right? Like there's been such a drastic increase in our quality of life over the last say 25, 30 years, and probably more like even 50. Mm -hmm. um, while at the same time things were getting cheaper, right? Like our cell phones are way nicer, but they're proportionally cheaper than they used to be. More people have access to these things. And all of a sudden that's, that's changing. And it, it feels very odd to me. You know, I, I, you know, I'll comment to Nick, like it, it feels odd that we are raising young children at a time when for now, I don't think this will last forever. We'll talk about that here in you know, just the next minute or two. For now, it almost feels like the quality of life is decreasing that's because right. we can't get electrical service. Like that's a, that's a thing that you just need to have. You know, this, right. this whole building has electric stoves and not a single person can use their stove. So we've deployed like air fryers and Instapots and other things. And, and you get and, some camping stoves. Yeah. And, and luckily it works out because these are studios and, and one bedroom apartments. So actually these people are like delighted to have these smaller cooking utensils. But, you know, I think most of us think of a of an oven, of a stove as a general part of, of you know, a living experience. And like, we just can't make it happen. It's not about the amount of money. It's not, you know, who do we need to call? It's the part just doesn't exist. So I hope that you like the iPhone or Android that you have right now, because it might be your last one for a little bit. It might be your last one for a little bit. And I'm not telling you to go out and buy some extras or whatever. Just, you know, the new phone comes out every year that that might change soon. Um, Someone shared, I had to wait one year for a car key fob from Toyota due to a transformer shortage. We were with some friends this weekend and they were sharing that um, the the husband's father had passed away and he had inherited his car. I'm like, oh, you know, are you enjoying daily driving it? Does it you know remind you of your father? He's like, well, it it actually needs a battery. And I'm like, oh you know, tell me more about that. And he's like, it's been on back order for eight months, like a car battery, you guys. That's a hundred $150,000 car needs a $100 battery. And that battery has gone extinct from the global supply chain. It cannot be found at any price. There is going to be a lot more of this in the near future. So many of the things that you're going to buy are going to get a lot more expensive in the short run, which is going to push up inflation, which is going to push up interest rates. And critically, the world's going to become a lot more unstable because when we're not shoveling a hundred billion dollars per year into China, China's going to say, well, maybe we should just give this whole Taiwan invasion thing a go because because we don't have much to lose. But critically, but does that make sense? Like this is like um, and this isn't like a political statement about China. This is a this is a, a, a statement about the behavior of human beings. But this is like the kid that needs to get some attention mm -hmm. of, well, you know, what can I do to kind of change the way things are going right now? Because the way things are going are not the way we want them to go. Let's cause a temper tantrum. And again, that's not a political statement about any country or yep. those sorts of things. It's a, it's a commentary on understanding human behavior. But you mentioned the Evergrande failure. So there's an estimate out there that China has an extra 1 billion homes. So they've only got, you know, one and a half billion people. Why? Why would China build an extra one and a half, one billion homes? Can anyone take a guess at that? Just put yourself into the the mind of, of Xi Jinping for a moment. Why would anyone allow something totally as insane as building an extra one million homes? Why would they let that happen? Under what circumstance would you need an extra billion homes? Job creation. That's exactly right. That's the immediate effect. Becoming a global magnet for workers. They actually don't love immigration in China. Uh, they're very keep the economy going. Yep. What event could happen where suddenly you'd need a whole bunch more homes, like an extra billion homes? Can anyone think of what that might be? And it's not pretty. War. Think about that for a moment. Think about the determination of a foe who's willing to build an extra one billion houses. So they've got some spares just in case they need them. And then you understand where the world is at geopolitically.
that is where the that that is where the world is at right this second. So in the long run, all this stuff is going to be hugely pop, uh, uh, hugely amazing for the United States, but in the short run, yeah, we took a we took a like a low energy turn there. Like I feel like we need to like breathe, <laughs> like this whole. Awesome. If if the world can stay stable, then this will be very good for the United States because we're vertically integrating. We're bringing these jobs home. We're bringing these capabilities home. If another pandemic or whatever happens, we won't have the, the things that we talked about. You remember when we talked about the Baltics dry good index? I had never heard of those words before the pandemic. That's how much it costs to ship something across the world. Well, if we have it in our own states, then we don't need to ship it. And so long-term, this will be very good for the United States. I mean, we feel like we need to like... Change the energy a little yeah. bit there. Well, we got lots of optimism in this slide. <laughs> so uh, you might recognize a few of these bullet points from years past from, from last year, but there's three things that have really really kept inflation and interest rates low for the last 20, 25 years. People have been like, man, why, why has inflation and interest rates been so low? That's because uh, labor costs were falling in real terms. We were offshoring jobs from the United States to China. In, in real terms, we traded the American middle class for cheap socks and other consumer goods. That's a, a trade that we consciously made for the last 20 or 25 years. We also bought world peace, so not, not a terrible trade, really. Uh, production costs fell in real terms due to global supply chains, like the cost to make, say, a pot went down by like 90% with global supply chains and offshore labor. So instead of a, a pot costing 100 bucks, it costs 10 bucks. That's that's pretty amazing, right? Um, uh, and then low energy prices. So fracking, horizontal drilling. Uh, America became a net energy exporter for the first time in modern history in the 2000s. That's like an insane thing. It should be the front page of CNN every single day. That's such a huge impact. Those things are kind of going away, though. Uh, you know, Keystone XL pipeline was shut down. Uh, are, is it really possible there can be, you know, continued, you know, productivity gains? You know, all these global supply chains are getting shorter, but the future is probably going to be very bright for a few, a few very interesting reasons. So reshoring, it's going to be a short-term expense, but in the long run, it's going to literally resurrect the, the U.S. middle class. It's going to be like returning to that, you know, beautiful future everyone fondly remembers from the 1950s when you go to Tomorrowland at Disney or something like that. It's going to be truly spectacular. Uh, it, it will. Uh, AI, Taylor Swift and a Disney reference in one night. I, and we're on fire. We are. We're, we're drinking water, too. Yep. not even caffeine in these drinks. Yeah. Uh, AI will drive a productivity revolution that supersedes the debt cycle. Uh, Rachel, if you can, can you put a link to Ray Dalio's debt cycle video in there. It's a half hour, but gosh, I really recommend you check it out. So he talks about inflation, interest rates and stuff. And at the end, he says, productivity is all that really matters per, you know, per capita productivity. And here's the thing, the US spends more on per capita productivity uh, than any other country. Uh, in fact, we are poised to launch the next industrial, the next te technological revolution better than any other country. AI will almost certainly be born in the United States. That's a terrifying thing. The singularity is near, but it like he, he all next year, there's a good chance AI might be answering your email. Think about the impact on productivity that has for the average American knowledge worker versus like, you know, someone working in, in Bangalore that that is out, out of work, that's been put out of work by AI. It's going to be a huge thing. Uh, and, and all these things are going to happen in, in the tangible immediate future. I think when you read this list, you think, yeah, like that's all probably going to happen. These, are, these things are all probably going to happen. If you haven't grabbed the the link there for the Ray Dalio economic machine, make sure you you take a, a watch of that. It is it is so good. So is it all bad? No, there is a lot of reason for optimism. So the pandemic is 100% over. I think last year we said like the pandemic is over. We'd have to go back and like look at the slide, but it's definitely over, right? Very few people are wearing masks. Maybe if they have a you know a specific health need or a specific you know certain feeling about masks, but for the most part, you don't see masks in a typical day. For the first time in a generation, because of the things that happened through the pandemic, the United States is the unquestioned leader of the free world. There's been all these changes and conversations and things happening, and we've emerged again as the unquestioned leader of the free world. And believe it or not, we are doing far better than anywhere else in the world. There's countries with, you know, double digit inflation, 70% inflation, like, you know, seven or 10 or 9% doesn't seem that bad in comparison to 50 or 70%. We had an erosion of middle class spending, but not a complete decimation. And our Fed got it under control in a relatively short period of time with, in the grand scheme of things, not that much pain, right? Wages are high, unemployment is low, consumer spending is still good. There's all this chatter about a recession and those sorts of things. But the data shows that the economy is actually doing quite well 
well. And so one has to wonder, is the, the chatter kind of social contagion and it's what's in the news and you know, people feel that way, but they behave a different way, right? When they're really voting with their wallets, they're, they're behaving a different way. Specifically in residential real estate, inflation is kind of a double-edged sword because only coming from the perspective of being an owner of residential investment real estate, inflation is our friend because real estate, this is the most important sentence in capitalism, real estate is a hard asset indexed to inflation backed by paper debt. Real estate is a hard asset indexed to inflation backed by paper debt. A hard asset means it's dirt and sticks and bricks and electrical mains, if you can get them, and all of the things that are you know actual things that you can touch with your hands. Index to inflation means that in general, when inflation goes up, the price of housing goes up. And backed by paper debt means that although the value of that piece of property goes up, the bank doesn't call and say, hey, I know you, you know, only owed us a million dollars last year, but because the value went up, now you owe us 1.2 million. The interest rate might change, but the absolute value of the debt does not change. That means that inflation is our friend in residential real estate because it drives up our net worth because of the increase in asset value. There's also been massive rent growth over the last several years. That's leveled off, you know, likely because it has reached some affordability limits and, you know, wages went way up, but then wages have leveled off some. So then rent growth has leveled off some, but it appears to be here to stay, even in markets that have really been hit hard, it's really only been like a negative 5%. So on the net, comparing to say 2018 or 2019, there's been massive rent growth incredible appreciation in single family and multifamily. That's why there has not been that wave of foreclosures, particularly in the single family space, because someone could just sell. You know, there's so much equity in their home that even if, say, they lost their job and somehow were unable to get another job with, you know, this historic gap in the number of job openings, and maybe they had a disability or something like that, they would they would just be able to sell their home and, and reap that appreciation, that equity that they created. So those that survive this winter will thrive in spring. And I think a, a really positive spring for, is coming for residential real estate. So okay. here are our predictions. Go for it. Here are our 2024 economic predictions. Go for it. So it's, it's winter time, but it's a winter time that's going to be okay. It'll be a little scary. There's going to be a, a couple of wars, hopefully not any more wars. The bank see. Yeah. I mean, there's been yeah. some scary times where you know, I think we all wondered, like, is this the thing, right? Was it the SVB collapse? Was it Ukraine? Was it Israel? Like, is this the thing that's going to break the economy? It hasn't been that bad overall, despite some of those you know scary days. Yeah. So we're going to see uh, Treasury rates continue to decline. We're going to see Fed rates start to come down by 12 months from now. Uh, unemployment is going to rise slightly, but not much. The Fed said things like we need, you know, 20 million people lose their job. I, you know, I forget what the that's, that's a, over 10 million people lose their job. I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen. In fact, I think wages are actually going to rise. Uh, the U.S. dollar is going to remain strong and, and remain the currency of the world. There's a question about de-dollarization at our event a, a few months ago. And that's just, uh, for me, I don't know, that's not something I'm, I'm worried about. Um, Inflation is going to keep getting better, but it's never going to be like the uh, the offshoring days. Um, reshoring is going to pick up steam, which is going to generate massive GDP growth. The GD print, the annualized GD print last quarter was 4.9%. Our GDP growth is exceeding China's. That's mm -hmm. like, the, it's just crazy town. Again, think, the whole world is about to flip uh, here in the next couple of years. Um, we're going to start to feel AI. AI is going to start answering your emails. Your your email AI is going to talk to someone else's email AI, and and we can all just ride off into the sunset jobless, I guess. I don't know. You are going to feel AI in the next 12 months, though. You're going to have visceral things that you impact in your day-to-day -day life where it's going to be weird. And it's going to unlock massive productivity for the U.S. workforce. Uh, the U.S. is going to do better with AI than anyone else, and uh, we're going to think we're, we're going to figure out things are pretty bad in China, far, far worse than anyone. The Chinese birth rate has fallen seventy percent since twenty seventeen. That is uh, not just the steepest birth rate decline in history. That's the steepest birth rate decline in history by like two X. See what I mean by all these like this has never happened before. Like mm -hmm. we're getting all of them in the last like three to five years. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Um, something I thought about is, Rachel, would you, would it be possible for you to fire up just a, a one question Google survey? The question I would like to have, I'd love to have all of you participate in this. We have a, you know, a decent sample size if you all play along, is are you consciously using AI in your day-to-day -day life? So let's define that as are you consciously using AI more than, say, three days per week? I would love to have that data. And if, yeah. it, if it would be, oh, we're getting lots of no's right off the bat. Okay, very, wow. very interesting. 
a um, couple of yeses, but okay, I guess we don't need to do the survey. You guys are just boom, boom, boom. Um, I'm blown away by those results. It's on the week, one to two days per week. No, no, very interesting. I mean, you guys can see these these coming through. Um, Rachel, maybe can you just kind of you know do an informal tabulation of these? Sure. Um, maybe sure. in uh, January or February, our community power hour can be on AI. We yeah, are got to do that. Yeah. yeah, we're using it every single day. We're we're talking about it, um, teaching our team members. There's all sorts of ways to use it, both in your job and in all sorts of other areas in your life, summarizing books, making travel itineraries, telling you about, you know, what to see in a certain city, um, coming up with recipes. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's like a friend that you just, you know, talk to. like, I, you know, these are my dietary goals. What should I eat tonight? And it'll tell you, I'm going to visit this city. What are the top three things I need to see, you know, based on my demographic data? And it'll tell you it's very powerful um, and, and can just really be you know, life-changing for people. And it will be, you know, it's, it's, it's coming whether you participate in it or not. So knowing you know, more about it just empowers you. So we'll do a, a community yeah. battle around that. So to revisit our question from last year, will there be a collapse, a 2008 style collapse in the single family housing market? Nope. Nope. So here's the data from Rochester. This is hot off the presses, you know, because it's only December 11th. So this data would have been, you know, tabulated in the days last couple of days. Yeah. Um, so this is for November, 2023. Year to date home sales are down 14%. There's just, you know, no inventory to, to sell. Um, days on market has gone up. 35%. It's still only 38 days. That is not very long. If you figure that the typical time from getting under contract to actually closing is generally about 28 to 30 days, you know, homes are getting under contract at seven or eight days. So if you, you know, ask a, a, a lay home seller, how many days was your home on market? They're going to say like a week because in their minds, like we got it under contract, you know, a week later, and then it actually closed 30 days after that. Home prices are down just a little bit, 1.5%. That's what Nick was saying to the person who said, I'm not seeing home prices going down in my market. In many markets, they've not gone down. In some markets, they've continued to climb. In the markets where they've gone down, it has not been steep. And so if you're not like in the data, you may not notice. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily notice a 1.5% dip, you know, despite being in the market every single day. But because of supply and demand, which we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides, it seems to us kind of the conclusion we're you know coming to as we're really digging into the data over the last several weeks and months is that home prices just really aren't going to go down. They're they're very sticky despite rising interest rates, and then inventory has gone up ten percent, but it's still historically Insanely low, very 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 low. A healthy market should have about six months of inventory. Many markets in the country have you know one and a half months, two months, and that's a trend that's been happening for many, many years because of the post 2008 rush of builders leaving the market, going bankrupt, moving into other professions, and then just, just never coming back. We've talked about that many times that led to this housing crisis. Well, 2008 was you know, 15, 16 years ago now, that crisis took you know, a decade and a half for us to get into. It's gonna take a decade and a half for us to get out of, for us to literally build our way out of this housing crisis. And it might even be longer because of the increase in regulation and code and, and other things that make it much harder to build real estate than it used to be. Um, so we're we're in this you know supply and demand um, conundrum, depending on if you're trying to buy or if you already own. So why does it feel like there's some sort of crash? That's just because housing sentiment is uh, it's very low right now. People are still remembering the good old days two years ago when they could get a you know we have a two and a half percent mortgage on our personal home, and so comparatively uh, things don't feel so good right now, and and that's okay. Um, the fact is affordability is the worst it's been in forty years. Prices shot up, then interest rates shot up, and so uh, affordability. If you if you look on this chart, it's the lowest since nineteen eighty five when interest rates were at like, you know, 17%. So affordability is terrible right now. That's okay. It's okay to feel bad. We're in winter. That's normal. Spring is coming. We just finished with our harvest harvest season. So it's okay to feel bad. Um, housing, housing supply remains insanely low. So look back to the, you know, the OA crash. We had 10 months of inventory. This is the story. You see how there was this, this huge run up of inventory pre-crash, right? Within see that? peaking in 08. And inventory right now is so low it's so low that there would need to be, uh, you know, a cataclysmic event to try to to actually move prices. When inventory is this low, um, it's it's difficult for me to imagine what would actually, 
you know, be required to, to move prices. The reason why inventory is so low is because most Americans have amazing two and a half percent mortgages like uh, like Elaine and I do. In fact, if you go look at uh, look at this chart, this is a very beautiful chart. I just enjoy looking at it here. But you can see that green bar. Less than three percent. So twenty percent of Americans have a, a mortgage that's three percent or lower. Blue is is three to four uh, percent. So right now, sixty percent of Americans, sixty percent of Americans have a have a mortgage that's four percent or lower, which means their mortgage payment is going to double if they were to buy a new house. So you'd have to move into a house that costs half as much as your current house costs in order to to keep your mortgage the same. So people just aren't going to make a move. Let, mm -hmm. Let's say you have a, a high paying profession, you would be better off and, and you lost your job. Let's say you're a physician and you lost your job and you couldn't find a new job as a physician. You'd be better off probably being a barista and relying on your spouse's income or something just to keep your mortgage because mm -hmm. your mortgage is just so lucrative right now. So no one is selling their house anytime like, soon. Like, All we can like really think about that, right? Reasons why people sell their houses are because kids have moved out. Well, it's easier to just you know close some doors and close some you know HVAC vents and just not go in those rooms than it is to downsize because someone has died. Again, it's easier just to close off some areas of the house um, because um, families have split up because of divorces. Those are reasons why people downsize and that opens new inventory into the market. But people aren't downsizing. People aren't changing the size of the houses that they're living in. So they're not, you know, providing the market with this fresh supply for people who are in other areas of their lives, people who are, you know, getting married, having babies, moving families together. Those houses aren't coming into supply because it's easier just to stay in the house that you're currently in. This is very not normal. Yes, this is not normal. You know, typically you just you just move, you know, based on what's happening in your life circumstances. You can see that green line, which is the less than three percent. I mean, it was basically zero for the first seven years of when this data was collected. And then it just shot way up. Well, those people are, you know, it's kind of good, but it's also bad if they do want to move. They're kind of stuck in those houses. Um, and so this is in general you know, pretty bad for for the housing market. So the alter the alternative way to you know to to get inventory would be to build it right. So the existing homes, no one's going to sell their existing home, uh, but unfortunately, uh, builder confidence is, uh, is it's not like at 08 levels, but but it's down. Uh, I'm good friends with one of the largest uh, you know private home builders in uh, in in Tennessee, and they just uh, they just sold all their development lots. And they're doing, you know, exclusive, they're going to focus on multifamily for the next while because they don't see how they can make a profit in single family. And they have 12 multifamily buildings that are 100% complete, except for the electrical gear. So I don't know what that means for U.S. housing supply, but nothing good. Nothing good when one of the largest builders is buildings bring zero units online. That's that's not a good thing for housing supply. Uh, so no one is going to sell their existing home for the foreseeable future and builders are going to stop building. So what does that mean? Does that mean prices are going to go up or prices are going to go down? The, the fact is prices actually aren't that high. So if we look at a 4% trend line over the last uh, 30 years, um, you can see we were below trend for a while, kind of in the post-08 uh, post world. And, uh, you know, people wonder, is there going to be an 08 class? Well, well we were 21% over that trend in 06, 07, 05, and we're only 7% over that trend right now. So all the data shows that it's, it's possible there could be, you know, a correction in price, but just there, there's there's no room in the market. It, it's going to require inventory before prices go down, and prices aren't that high to begin with. Uh, and and understanding, you know, we we walk through a bunch of charts very quickly, but at the end of the day, those who ignore the law of supply and demand are uh, are, are 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 there's there's a saying I'm not conjuring forth here, but doomed are doomed. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, well said, Elaine. Thank you. Uh, there's there's not enough houses. There just there aren't. There's not enough places to live. Too many people, not enough houses. So it's very difficult for prices to go down. There's two main laws in in single family housing. One is that price and interest rate are generally inversely correlated. The other is the law of supply and demand. We've had enough supply for you know the last many many years. Supply slowly went down, so we didn't feel that law as much, and instead we really focused on the lesser law, which is the inverse relationship between interest rates and price. But in times of low supply, that law is that law is like big, 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 and the law of interest rate and price inversion is a small law. And so we're seeing the market move toward that more fundamental law of supply and demand. That's and deep. Thank you. Yeah, um, and 
you know, and, and we, there's been kind of this, this common consciousness of like, oh, as rates go up, prices will come down because that's what we've been used to when there wasn't as much of an imbalance with supply and demand. But right now the imbalance is so strong that people who need houses just find a way. They get more down payment. Maybe they get an early inheritance. They just absorb the, the housing payment and they're more house poor, able to spend less on other things because that there's so little supply that people have to just get into the housing even at these really high interest rates and then hope to refi at a future time. So here are our 2024 single family home predictions. There they are. All right. So we think that it will be a boring but mild winter for everyone but home builders. Home builders will experience a colder winter, more snow, you know, more days in the dark. But in general, people that own single family homes will have a fairly mild winter. Mortgage rates are going to start to come down. It's probably not going to be enough to unlock that pent up demand because if you think back to that really colorful chart, there's just so many people that have very, very, very low rates that if you go from say eight and a half to 7.75, that's, that's not going to be enough to really move the needle for the those folks. So sales volume will continue to remain very, very low, but not catastrophically low. Inventory will continue to be low. You know, my prediction is I think inventory is going to be low for 12 years. It's a long time. So it's going to be a long, a long time. time. Um, premium and new home. We had a bullet point inventory low, so we can check back in 12 years from now exactly. on the state of the market. Exactly. Um, premium and new home prices will decline as you know people are feeling that top line number of their mortgage payment, rising energy costs and their utilities. They're going to you know settle for, for a, a bit of a lesser home than maybe they had hoped for in previous years because they just need to get into a home. They've had a marriage, they've moved, those sorts of things. They just need to get into housing. And so they'll, they'll settle on features, size, those sorts of things. Starter home prices are going to be stable or even increase. That's just the law of supply and demand right there. There will be regional variation. The Sun Belt will struggle. The Midwest will do well. New home starts and deliveries slow down. There's a lack of labor. Wages are high. It's hard to get materials. Building regulation is very challenging. Zoning regulations are challenging in many places. All of these things are just this really negative confluence. And it's unfortunate that kind of the average consumer doesn't quite understand it. We're in an area where, you know, things are booming and there is a decent amount of new construction. And I'll watch on Facebook when say a new apartment building is announced and the general commentary, and of course it's Facebook, this is not a, like a peer reviewed study, but I'm trying to understand the general common consciousness and everyone complains about rents. But someone who understands rents well would say, oh, there's more supply. With more supply, rents must come mm -hmm. down. They would be very excited about new supply mm -hmm. coming onto the market. Um, people just don't quite understand because that's a second and third order effect that you know is, is many steps out. Um, rents will continue to increase as people who ordinarily would buy will have to rent because the gap between affordability of renting and owning is the worst it's ever been in favor of renting. It's, it's cheaper to rent. It is much more expensive to buy right now. And so those folks that maybe would have sold a home and then bought another home or would have um, matriculated from rental housing to ownership will stay in, well, they're able to move into rentals or they'll stay in rentals longer than, than they had anticipated. And then because of this, because most real estate agents are compensated based on commissions, which is, you know, the number of transactions that you have as their income goes down, they'll find other, other work and unemployment is so low, they'll have their opportunity to pick, you know, what other jobs they want to do. So they'll leave the market and then investors will exit, right? It's no fun to, you know, look at deals month after month after month, maybe you know, write offers, do all of these things and just get told no, 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 no. The numbers don't pencil all of these things. And so investors will exit. And this is my call to you that if you really are you know, committed to building your wealth, yes, it's a challenging time right now. Yes, the numbers are very hard to get them to make sense, but there are still opportunities out there. And literally every day, more people are leaving the market. And so that's more opportunity for you to find that inefficient point in your local market and solve a problem for someone when I kind of think of them as like, um, like a carnival game and like the people are just sort of like falling. And if you say like, I'm committed to this, 
there will be plenty of opportunity for you and you will know when spring has come before when all of those other people are still you know kind of hibernating and they'll miss that opportunity to to enjoy spring um so that's that's you know our predictions for for single family housing as people who own a lot of single family homes we're excited to own that inventory because it's just growing in value people want it it provides a need for for society it is a little harder to buy right now and we're toying with the idea of doing like a single family home fund or you know something like that again this is a not a fully baked idea i shared this at one of our last presentations because we're still you know playing with it looking at the numbers but with enough of a down payment you can kind of overcome some of that like down inertia from the high interest rate, it seems like home prices are going to continue to rise because there just aren't yeah. enough of them. So saying, I really want these valuable assets, even if they have very low cash flow in the meantime, because I'm really committed to the long game, there's just not enough of them. And yep. that law of supply and demand is is so critical. And our market is absolutely a bottom, no, no doubt about that. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decision we talk about often. Absolutely. Lots of questions. I think now yeah. would be a, a good time. So we have our yeah. multifamily predictions. We'll we'll hop into those next. That wraps up our presentation. But I think it's a great time to cover any questions that talk about single family homes right now. Um, if, uh, if rates get lower, will buyers uh, return and prices rise again? Yes. When rates hit 5.5%, that's going to be the strike uh, for most people. And a related question there, um, how uh, are you know, people buying with cash? There was a question somewhere there. People buying with cash. Uh, I'm not sure if it's over on here, but the yeah, question was like, what are what transactions there are pending versus leverage? Is there any data on how RE is purchased, specifically cash versus traditional mortgage and other similar data? First time home buyers are continuing to buy with mortgages and they're just paying. Uh, we help first-time home buyers buy homes all the time, and their average mortgage is like two thousand twenty two hundred a month. The mortgage on our personal home with a fifteen-year mortgage is thirty. No, how much is it? Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Yeah. So our mortgage is only double a first-time home buyer in our market. Uh, that, that's that's crazy, but that's just that's the math. So those first-time home buyers are just buying it, knowing they can refi down in the future. People who are buying premium homes, they are often buying with cash. They are often buying with cash, and that's why those values are coming down on the premium homes and the, the values on the starter homes are staying stable or even increasing. And there was another question. What are some of the biggest barriers for home builders? It's a whole confluence of things. That's why it's a little hard to solve. Um, lack of labor, high wages, high regulatory environment, high ancillary costs for things like health insurance, dental benefits, those sorts of things. Um, difficulty with zoning in many areas. Um, how do I describe this? Like kind of what I was saying of in our area, we see that people are upset about new apartment buildings, although they should be excited about it because that will lower the the price of rent. Mm -hmm. So uh, cultural sentiment against builders, there's this idea over it because of the last several years that real estate developers are, you know, just these money bags type people. And, you know, the truth of it is building is incredibly scary, very low margins, a ton of risk. But when people are coming to city council and saying, you know, don't allow that zoning or don't give that tax credit or those sorts of things that slows down the, the production of supply. So it's a definitely a multifactorial multifactorial problem. Um, what other questions? Fed recover rates rapidly because the economy goes into recession. Does that mean we will get into recession next year? Honestly asking. Uh, excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, it's entirely likely. Uh, I think that the Fed is going to have to cut because uh, our current circumstances are simply unsustainable. Um, and I could I could dig very deeply into that. Right. This. Yeah, it is blazing hot in here. I'm, um, I could go. <laughs> I sweater off and everything. Sea, a fan. Just it's okay. wintertime in Minnesota. Uh, so I think there will be like a like a mild recession, essentially, but not in the way like you're going to see banks go under. You're going to see home builders go bust. Uh, it's not going to be a main street thing. It's going to be a little bit more of a wall street thing. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, how should we approach leveraging debt and down payments in light of the current, current lending environment? Put more down, baby. Yeah. I mean, that's really kind of the only way to, to do it. Um, you know, banks require more down so that you're within your DSCR limits, your debt service cover ratio. Banks want to see 1.2, which basically means after your rents come in, all of your expenses, except your mortgage payment goes out. They want to have at least a 1.2 multiple. So if your mortgage payment is a thousand dollars, they want you to have $1,200 before your mortgage is paid. So to get there with these high interest rates and relatively high sticky prices, you just have to put more down. That's a, an excellent question. 
question. From a bullet point on this slide, I'm wondering with real estate slash multifamily investments not as attractive when inflation is this high, what are your thoughts about investments in oil and gas domestically produced as an alternative? Excellent question. So we don't give any investment advice. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we like to entertain. Um, real estate is very good as a hedge against inflation. So I don't know if you meant to say with interest rates high, um, we have been writing offers all year long. And if we can get one of our offers accepted, we're going to be elated about that. So uh, housing tends to do extraordinarily well if you already own it during periods of inflation, particularly if you have fixed rate debt, because interest rates tend to go up in concert with inflation. Oil and gas, I think, is a pretty good bet. We lived in Oklahoma for 10 or 15 years, and we're very familiar with the oil and gas industry as a result of that, just that ge geographic proximity. People would knock on your door and ask if you want to invest in oil well. It's, it's literally that tangible. Uh, I think that it's a good thing to invest in for the short run, uh, which which fracking helps a lot with that. If I would not invest in a non-fracked well, I also would not recommend investing in a natural gas well or, or natural gas operation. I would do uh, I would do a, an aggressively fracked uh, oil well right now that you can get your money out in you know like a couple of years, ideally, very short time horizon on that. That's not investment advice, by the mm -hmm. way. Just if I we don't invest in oil and gas, we, we invest, invest in real estate. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Ryan Lauren had a question. Since smaller banks are getting scorched by real estate assets that are not paying debt service or worse, what do you think DSL, DSCR loans will require a higher point to consider them lending in 2024, mostly thinking about multifamily and commercial loans? So we're still seeing that 1.2 ratio. We've not seen a request for anything higher. Sometimes with larger deals, banks will request an interest reserve. So basically you like prepay the first you know, three or six or 12 months, it's all a negotiation. That was happening even before rates have gone up. I would say the things that banks are most interested, you know, our experience is they want liquidity. Um, so it used to be, you know, you'd go to get a mortgage, let's say on a $10 million apartment building. And they're like, oh, cool. You know, I heard you have a fund. Can you put the fund bank account at our bank? And we're like, no, you know, we already have it at ABC Bank and all the you know, utility bills come out of it. It's all connected to our QuickBooks. And, you know, we've got all these accountants, like it's just the work to do that. Like, we're just, we're just not going to do that. And they're like, okay, you know, we just had to ask. And then it became, well, you know, we need a small amount. Maybe you can put, you know, a year's worth of mortgage payments in our bank. Um, and you, you just set it up that the mortgage payment is automatically drawn out of that. And I'm like, oh, you know, I don't love that. That's another bank, another login and other things for the accountants to watch. But, you know, we need to stay pretty liquid anyway. So that works, you know, we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll still run the utility bills and all the other things out of this other account. But sure, we'll put, you know, a year of, of mortgage payments at the bank. And now it's, you will put this much money at the bank or you just don't get the loan. Mm -hmm. We've not seen yeah. that before. I would say that's the thing that, that we're seeing. Bank most. Strata cash. Yeah. Speaking of which, there was a question from Victoria. Do you mind sharing where you're keeping your cash, keeping any cash while waiting for spring? Still reasonable to keep in T-bills or possibly longer term notes. So yes, we would keep excess cash in the fund in T-bills, kind of back before that was cool when they were running a 5% uh, rate. Uh, these days, uh, we actually go to all of our lending partners and we say, hey, you are going to give us a 4 or 5% interest rate on our depository business, or we will take our business elsewhere. Uh, you know, if you have depository business, substantial amounts of depository business, you are the prize. And we love to, you know, make sure we're treating our, you know, bankers with, uh, you know, respect and, you know, being nice. But we also uh, need to aggressively fight for uh, for our uh, you know, investors' interest, uh, literally and figuratively. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we're getting, you know, four to five percent on our depository business. That's not a CD. That's not a money market. That's not a T bill. Literally, just our checking account. Uh, that's that's pretty unheard of historically. But we do have, you know like seven or ten million dollars in depository business and just cash that's on hand right now so the banks are very excited to win our depository business we're a small piece of it absolutely uh the last question and then we'll we'll move on to our multifamily predictions um so will we be a renter nation for how long is this a new normal um i think it's a little early to tell um i think you know my prediction 10 minutes ago was i think we will have a very critically low supply situation for say 10 to 12 years 
So during that time, you know, maybe we we trend more toward a renter nation. There's also cultural reasons why we're moving more toward a renter nation. People don't stay in jobs for 20 or 30 years. They move every three to five years. People change whole careers in a way. You know, maybe you used to go from you know Dell to IBM and now you just go to a completely different career. So they're moving to you know completely different geographies to benefit from different economies. People just want more freedom than they used to. Um, people are getting married later, having children later, all sorts of things, wanting to experience different things, you know, live in a downtown condo in this city and then a little, you know, hobby farm in, in this city. And so people want to rent. Um, so I, I think, you know, will we be a renter nation? That's a little tough to say. I, I guess my thought is I don't think so because Americans just so value home ownership. It's been so indoctrinated in us, but maybe over the next 10 years, you know, some of that, some of that will change. But those are, those are kind of some of my thoughts that I think that the folks that maybe can't afford home ownership aren't as emotionally busted up about it as people who maybe couldn't have afforded home ownership, say 20 or 25 years ago, that was like a devastating, like, failure to launch sort of feeling. And now it's like, well, that's okay. I'm going to you know, move to Austin and change jobs anyway. So I only need this lease for the next, you know, six or 12 months. It is indeed move to Austin. That <laughs> That's right. Did you like that? Yeah. All right. Let's talk about multifamily housing. All right. So uh, prices in multifamily, doom and gloom, sky is falling. They're theoretically down as much as 25%. You might see a headline or something to that effect. But that's kind of a meaningless number because transactional volume is down like 50 to 90%. Nothing is trading. And what little is trading is basically a foreclosure, distress sale, something like that. So uh, if you don't have to sell, who cares what the street price is? Well, it's it's not as relevant anyway. Um, so price discovery has not occurred and everything's going to change after interest rates come down and, uh, and distress is cured. Uh, but the fact is... Uh, 2024 is going to be a rough year for multifamily. It's, it's going to be a real rough year. Let's look at rents. Uh, people, I think uh, you see headlines about rents, uh, you know, declining and stuff, because for the first time uh, in a very long time since 2010 and the pandemic, uh, rents are rents are in decline. So these are these are averages, but uh, you're going to see it, it varies quite a bit uh, from market to market. This is, this is the Fannie Freddie numbers here. So this, they're expecting rents are going to stay, you know, pretty steady. There's no no free fall in, in rents or anything like that. Um, you know, going back to our PSA that we headlined with, uh, it's a very inefficient market, the real estate market, and there's huge, huge, huge variations from region to region. It's hyper local. So Austin, they're down 4.8%. And they're making more reason to go get an apartment there. Let's move to Austin. We're at, we've been in Austin like three times in the last month. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and vacancies doubled by the way. So when, when you see rates, uh, falling rental rates, falling your vacancies doubled, that's enough to just eviscerate a deal, uh, seeing a, a 5% decline in rents and let's say a 5% bump in vacancy right there. Uh, Phoenix, uh, I think is actually worse than this number indicates. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it's I not think, that bad. I think Phoenix is the market to watch over the next three to four years because it has more new constructions. You know the stat better than I do. What is it? The new construction 10, start? 10% of all new multifamily units in the entire country. Okay. So 10 coming online in Phoenix. 10%, in your city. Right. Phoenix is not 10% of the U.S. population. So, let's, let's establish that. so that's the city to watch to, mm -hmm. to say, what exactly does supply do? How do people emotionally respond to it? How do owners decide how to price their rents? What concessions they need to do? What, are, what do renters feel like? What's the psychology of the renter in that area? Um, Phoenix is a market to... I think it's a bad, you know, again, we don't give investment advice, but I wouldn't invest my own money in Phoenix right now because there's too much supply coming onto the market, but it's going to be something that's very interesting to watch over the next three to four years. Well, maybe I'd invest in it today. I definitely wouldn't have invested in it two years ago. <laughs> and isn't it funny, New Jersey, Cincinnati, Chicago, leading the, the pack with rent growth, um, these are not the places you think of as, as hotbeds of, of, of rent growth, but we've talked about this, how these are markets that did not, you know, get these crazy rent growth uh, trajectories through the pandemic. And all of a sudden they're super affordable. Like New Jersey is relatively affordable compared to where it was historically. Um, Minneapolis, uh, Baltimore, uh, you know, Orange County, 1.7%. Um, so these are, these are markets that just, they really struggled through the pandemic and they're, and they're catching up. Uh, and you can see the, the Sun Belt is really struggling. Uh, it's, it's a very regional thing. 
Uh, this this is an example of how when a market becomes more efficient, right, the Sunbelt has become more efficient as more operators are in that market, right? Think about if you're on a number of mailing lists, like you would probably have a bit of a hard time telling a newsletter apart from, you know, say one operator to, to B operator um, because the market has become so efficient in those areas. That's generally good for a consumer, right? So lowering rent prices is good for the consumer that's living in these properties and bad for the owner because there's so much efficiency in that market. That's, you know, kind of the double-edged sword of capitalism. But inefficient markets, blue ocean markets, where there aren't as many uh, operators that are all competing for the same assets, that are all kind of running the same playbook, the same marketing, the same, you know, same marketing going out to investors, same marketing going out to renters, those markets... That's less good for the average consumer because there isn't as much competition. So the market then becomes inefficient and then the, the rents are going up and that's good for asset value. So here's an example of how very efficient markets, i.e. red ocean markets, probably not the best place to invest. Blue ocean markets are inefficient and there's probably more opportunity to solve problems in those markets and benefit from being the one to, that solves those problems. Indeed, love it. All right, so let's talk about uh, new multifamily units under construction. There's another kind of doom and gloom, skies falling headline type thing. Maybe you've heard of that, like more multifamily units under construction than any time since 1970. That was a long time ago. It was 50 years ago. So things must be real bad, right? Well, that's not the whole story. So if we go just, just, just half a layer deeper here, remember, there are 2.5 times more units and more people today than there were in 1970. So as a percentage, it's not that bad. In fact, you can even see that uh, that percentage of new supply back in the 70s was uh, you know, pushing 6%. It's less than 2% uh, growth today if you look at the uh, the supply expansion rate and, and the units completing it. And we're part of that problem. Uh, let, let me just kind of explain to you how, how this all came to be. So Stonehaven phase one was 30 units. Stonehaven phase two was 30 units. And then Stonehaven phase three was supposed to be 30 units. And we said, whoa, interest rates are about to skyrocket. So let's make Stonehaven phase three 60 units. Let's double the size of Stonehaven phase three. It was supposed to be four phases. Yeah, so we four, just absorbed four phases the fourth made phase three. in. Yeah, uh, we are not geniuses and our, our strategy was not unique. Every multifamily developer in the country said, oh, you know, we've got two phases or three phases of this thing. Let's do it all at once and lock in this low interest rate and get it all done now. But here's the thing. Did, uh, did someone make a wave magic wand and double the number of construction workers in the United States? Or electrical mains. Or electrical main service gear. No, no, they did not. So now we have my friend that has 12 apartment buildings that are 100% complete with no electrical main service gear. So this is looking at permits. These, all of these stats, these are, these are looking at permits and they're looking at uh, developer reported completion dates. Developers, you kind of have to be an insane optimist to even pretend to be a developer. It's just such an unforgiving trade. Um, so it's very unlikely that these deliveries will actually occur on schedule because they're just, there's not double the construction workers, you know, that you, you go from 2021, you know, to 2023, 2025, and it, and it doubles. That's just, it, it doesn't work that way. That's not how, how society works. So the end outcome of this is that there's going to be a glut of new units. They're going to be focused in uh, some specific units like, or uh, markets like Phoenix. Uh, but overall it's, it's not going to be that bad Th Things are going to be okay. You know, two years from now. We're very interested in any type of technologies or changes that will bring more supply into the market. Yes. That's why we did the webinar, I think it was two months ago, um, with the company that's doing 3D home printing. So Rachel, maybe you can pop that into the chat. If you haven't had an opportunity to watch that replay, I highly recommend it. It's very interesting to see how that technology is making, it's solving a lot of the problems for, okay. for new home construction. Materials are less expensive. Um, the energy efficiency is higher. So then the utility costs are lower. They're basically just concrete structures, so insurance costs are lower. Um, you don't need as many workers. You can build a single-family home with four workers, and the rest of it is done by the machine, by the robot. So all sorts of other things that I talk about in there. Um, but it's very interesting to see, you know, how is society going to solve the problem of getting more supply into the market again? It took us. 15, 16 years to get into this, it's going to take us that long to get out of it. But a lot of things are going to change. And I'm really curious to see who's creative and, and brings innovation to the market. So let's look at the most important chart uh, in, in you know tonight's time together. So this is uh, buying versus renting in the, in the United States going back to 1970. So it's a pretty good uh, print of data here. 
And you can see that things got pretty bad in the 80s there where it was double the cost to, to own as it was to rent. Uh, and then it kind of settled. You can see there's an equilibrium point where renting and owning is about the same, which makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, a landlord buys a property and hopefully needs to rent it out at a profit, right? Hopefully owning is a little bit, you know, less expensive than renting, so to speak, on on average basis. Sometimes it's a it's a break even uh, on a month to month basis or year to year basis. But then you you realize the capital gain and have some other you know wealth builders uh, that go from uh, you know, come from investing in real estate. But in general, there, there's an equilibrium that that goes up and down. And right now, uh, it's uh, you know the cost to buy is about twenty seven hundred a month. The cost of rents uh, eighteen fifty. This is the largest you know actual dollar uh, nominal dollar spread uh, ever. Um, you know again as a percentage, it's only about fifty, maybe a little bit less than fifty percent more expensive than to own than to to rent. Um, so it was actually worse back in the eighties. This is why it seems like you can't make money investing in real estate these days because it costs more to own than to rent. Right? Intuitively, if you go buy something and it costs it's, it costs you, the investor, twenty seven hundred a month to own the thing, and then you can only rent it out for eighteen fifty. Well, that is a loss making proposition. And this also does does not include insurance, maintenance, utilities. Um, that's not included. Whereas you know, yeah. renters maybe renters are paying their own utilities, but they're not paying their own maintenance, and they're typically not paying their own insurance. Yep. So that, the, the spread is actually way worse than it looks. So if those if that spread tightens up. You're going to see a lot more opportunities, more real estate investment propositions will make money. But right now, things are tough. Things are really difficult. And so we're in winter and it's tough to make a deal work. That's all there is to it. So look at this chart and just say to yourself, it's winter, baby. That's that's all there is to it. It's winter and, and it's going to be okay. And our multifamily predictions for 2024, here they are. It's going to be a freezing, brutal winter. So this is where I was saying a while back that the markets have diverged between single family housing and multifamily housing because of interest rates, because of mm -hmm. the type of debt. Single family homes are typically 30 year fixed conventional mortgages. Multifamily is typically variable rate debt. And there's been this whole slew of debt funds and other people in the market that aren't really in the business of lending. They're in the business of trying to get assets from operators, all sorts of things. Because of that, the tide will go out and we will find out which operators are swimming naked, which have had variable rate debt, did not stay liquid enough, did not understand who their lending partner was. Did their lending partner actually want to be in the business of lending or did their lending partner want to be in the business of asset ownership? Um, things will get worse. So as interest rates have gone up, people have used their liquid reserves. Um, they've maybe done a few capital calls. They've maybe deferred some maintenance, some other things eventually they will run out of cash. Eventually there's just you know nowhere to grab from. And it will be during that time that we'll see struggle in the, the multifamily market in 2024. Interest rates leveling out might save some failing operators. So they're watching interest rates very, very closely. If they continue to go up, right? That means their mortgage goes up. And if you're, you know, going out of a, a bank account that's getting thinner and thinner, that's not good. But if you're, you know, mortgage is high but stays steady, that gives you a little more time on the clock. Um, there's been lots of capital calls. LPs are running out of cash, asking questions of, you know, well, this this one already had a capital call. I don't have, you know, more cash to give. And so there's been kind of this rush of operators going into capital calls. Maybe they didn't even necessarily need the capital call at that point, but they had fear that, hey, my average investor has five investments. And if I'm the third to do the capital call, the money might not come in. So I'll just go ahead and be the first or the second. Um, sales volumes will increase many fold as people try to sell those deals before they run out of cash, try to, you know, find a way to harvest that equity, you know, do whatever they can to, to not allow those deals to just completely crash. Growing inventory because of that, but because of interest rates, it will be difficult to put deals together. So I really think there's going to be earnest sellers that are eager to make something happen and earnest buyers that are eager to make something happen. But because of that interest rate, it's going to be hard for them to find a price that makes the investors whole, that returns all the capital to the original investors, that makes sense for the new pool of investors that are coming in for the buyer. I think it's going to be tough, right? I think there's going to be a lot yeah. of, you know, the, the inventory, the, not the inventory, the market, the community is really quite small. Mm -hmm. And, you know, much like, you know, other communities in the world, like we're all friends with each other. We all like, you know, have each other's backs. We're trying to help each other. And I think there's going to be people that are really trying to put deals together and just there's going to be like suffering. It's like feels a little unwarranted, but if interest rates can come down a little bit, 
then maybe some of that won't happen. Mm -hmm. During this process, that's what's called price discovery. So right now, price discovery has not really happened because there's been so few transactions, right? If if in, in any given market, like say in our market, there's been, I mean, don't hold me to this, but like six or seven multifamily transactions, it's getting to be where appraisers are having a hard time finding data because the sales comps that they're pulling are, you know, 18 or 24 months old. Well, that's going to change as, you know, more deals hit the scene and that will um, unveil the, the process that's called price discovery. So prices are going to go down. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see exactly where price discovery happens. You know, we, we mentioned that 25% headline number. I'm not saying that prices are going to go lower than that 25%. I'm going to say actual price discovery will happen somewhere between zero and, and 25% lower. Um, there's going to be tons of regional variation. Sunbelt's going to struggle, just like we saw with the, the, the rent growth data. Uh, there will be more units that uh, get delivered than in you know 40 or 50 years. Uh, it won't be crazy or terrible, but rents will decline in the areas that are, that are most impacted there. And I think rents will be mostly flat in, in other places. Um, institutional players are going to get back in the game. So all the big players, they have been pencils down uh, for about 18 months now. The moment, the moment that we know that, that rates are coming down, the moment the feds start cutting, all the institutional players are going to come into the game. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all going to come in with it's like a dam yeah. being held by. It's a massive amount of capital. It's, it's like a trillion dollars of capital that's just waiting to come out and play. Um, in the meantime, though, a lot of brokers, syndicators, investors, they're going to they're going to have a really tough year and they're going to exit. Um, banks are going to try to work things out, but debt funds are going to eat their customers. Uh, so, you know, depending on what type of debt uh, the, those those GPs got, uh, that's going to determine their their fate. The banks are going to work with you. They're going to make things OK. And the, the predatory lenders that, that are in the loan to own business, well, they're going to they're going to be owners. That's for sure. Uh, the only saving grace from all this is let's say there is, God forbid, a, a world war or uh, uh, you know, some some you know big event, uh, some some negative event that happens, which I think is you know so, somewhat expectable uh, to happen in 2024. You know, it's geopolitical instability. It's it's you know right there on the top of our risk uh, chart. There, uh, then rates would come down suddenly, and ironically, that would save a lot of uh, a lot of these operators. Suddenly, they'd be able to get into new debt uh, without having to bring you know millions of dollars to the to the closing table on new debt. So those are our 2024 multifamily projections, predictions. There we go. We are going to wrap up talking about what we did in 2023 and what our plans are for Black Swan in 2024. So 2023 was a good year mm -hmm. for us. It, it felt, I think, slow to Nick and I. You know, we're entrepreneurs. We're investors at heart. We had four closings. We did enjoy the largest closing in Minnesota um, at the time in, in April. That was the largest residential real estate transaction. So we're excited about that. But we had no um, transactions that we got under contract in 2023. We have no closings on the horizon. And so instead, we shifted our focus to optimization and maximization of our business, asking ourselves, how how can we get more out of the assets that we already have? So we had 39% revenue growth year over year. Every Monday morning, we have our, our key performance indicator meeting where the whole team gets together and we have a, a series of numbers that people report. One of them is actual rent. So you can see how from March of 20, I'm sorry, April of 2023 to July of 2023, we went from a hair over a million per month in rents to 1.3 million. That's because we had that large closing. And then also because we went through our leasing season, we put units into circulation that came out of renovations. And then we had a series series of lease renewals. So that's a that's a lot of growth, right? A 30% growth in, in a year is a lot busy. for a business. A, you know, 39% growth in just a few months is staggering. And all of the things that had to go into that in terms of training and culture and resources and you know what we needed to do to, to allow our team to absorb that growth. We have hundreds of millions of full recourse fixed rate debt. So we watch interest rates, we're very curious about them, but we don't worry at night. We know that our mortgage payments are locked in for the, the time that's left on that fixed rate debt. We don't have a single penny of variable rate debt. We don't have a single rate cap. We do five-year fixed. Much of our debt is actually 10 years with a five-year reprice, and we've negotiated in a maximum of a 2% interest rate increase at that five-year mark. Um, so that's that's like some of the best debt we have in the whole portfolio. It's probably about 30% of our debt. Some banks didn't want to go for that over the last several years, but those that did you know, seemed excited about it, where we said, 
hey, we know five years is going to be here before we know it. We know we are long-term hold. We know we don't intend to sell this asset. So let's just make a, you know, a decision right now that we'll add right into the promissory note a maximum of a 2% interest rate increase at that five-year time frame, and then 10 years on that, that total note. We're very excited about you know, the, the earlier versions of ourselves that, that had the foresight to do that. Tons of liquid reserves. You know, we feel really good. We're sending out distributions to our investors. Very excited about that. No insurance exposure. So there's a reason why we've you know invested in the markets that we've invested in. We're following Florida very closely to understand like Florida is going through an insurance discovery process as commercial insurers leave the market. And it's kind of, you know, maybe potentially creating a situation where the state will be the only insurer. So very interested in that. We do feel some of that because insurers just have to get their premiums from somewhere. So they're getting, you know, rising premium rates in the Midwest, even though we aren't having natural disasters or those sorts of things. But we actually did this big meeting with our insurance agent just about two weeks ago and drastically reduced our insurance expenses. So those are the things that we're focusing on as we have more time to ask ourselves, how do we optimize and maximize the portfolio that we already have? We'll talk a ton about vertical integration. Vertical integration wins the day. I think vertical yeah. integration has always won the day, but I think in the next several years, you know, deep vertical integration is really going to separate those that that do well versus those that struggle a little bit more. And then we talked a lot about why we love the blue ocean markets. So internally, we're in a period of summer, uh, so we worked our hearts out. That's that's what you do in summer. It wasn't a, a ton of you know big sexy new projects that get under contract, uh, but that's as in, okay. As in zero. As in zero. <laughs> That's right. And that's what, see, like, we're having fun with it. Like, it would be easy to get discouraged. Like, oh, my God, we raised all this money. We're not spending it. Well, of course we didn't. We're in winter. We're, we're preparing for spring. And, and that's that's the beautiful thing. Patience is a posture of humility. Uh, so we knocked out 221 rehabs in the last 12 months. That's just a staggering amount of work, a truly staggering amount of work. You can see some of the people pictured there that, that make all those rehabs happen. We closed 7,884 maintenance tickets. So many maintenance tickets. We signed 633 leases. I uh, still work with our leasing team every week. I meet with them for an hour every week and review leases. I talk to them in real time. Uh, revenue is the lifeblood of any business. That's what generates our revenue. That is a lot of leases. Uh, we grew from 17 to 47 staff members. That's just, uh, we did a lot of hiring and interviews and, and and everything. I was running a training camp in in my office. I had like like bleachers set up in here as we were onboarding staff in the high season. Uh, and then uh, and then you know as, as things started to, to shift into winter here uh, in, in terms of the actual climate season, uh, we looked to control costs with vertical integration. We brought lawn, snow, construction facilities in house, saved millions of dollars, uh, and uh, and then we got to spend time in the lodge with our friends. So we launched a coaching program. I'm not going to say Elaine was bored, but she had a little less to do. Uh, she, she was personally responsible for Douglas Trail, and Douglas Trail has calmed down quite a bit. So that's like taking 90% less of her time. Um, so we got to hang out in the lodge with our friends. Um, let's take a look at uh, this next set of photos here. So this was our very first Douglas Trail unit with in-house flooring. So uh, we we're paying $5,800 per unit. These are big townhome units, so the flooring is expensive. We're paying $5,800 per unit to a flooring vendor to do really high-quality floors. Uh, we brought that in-house, uh, actually with that same flooring vendor, just that we're using our labor, but their supplies. We're now using an even higher quality product. And in the upstairs, we're doing that higher quality LVP product instead of carpet. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's complex doing LVP on a second uh, wood frame story of a 20 year old townhome. Um, so before we were just having the vendor put carpet up there using our in-house people, we're able to control uh, you know, quality. So, so we're able to get just an exponentially higher quality product in there. And you know what the cost difference was? Zero zero cost difference. We're able to get double, triple the quality into those units. That's the power of bringing these things in-house. Absolutely incredible. Um, we reviewed every single line out of expense. We found a duplicate newspaper subscription, uh, $6 a month uh, that we're paying twice. And I'm like, hey, is this like an accounting year? They're like, no, somehow y'all have two subscriptions to the newspaper uh, for the, like the online paper. So we, we canceled that duplicate subscription to the newspaper. Um, you know, just uh, developing a, a long-term staffing plan so that uh, no one gets left out in the cold. You know, we, we need a ton of staff in the high season. We don't need as many staff in the slow season. So they're out uh, spinning up short-term rentals and doing proactive unit checks. We're walking every single unit multiple times this winter, just making sure that everything looks as perfect as it should. And all of our tenants are, you know, following all the rules. Um, uh, we, you know, are getting really high rates of return on, on stored cash. Um, so lots of things that we're doing in the winter uh, to, to just uh, make sure 
sure that we're we're guarding guarding our stored harvest well. Does that does that idea of optimization and maximization make sense? We had a um, an email newsletter that went out. Rachel, maybe you can kind of add that to the bottom of our replay newsletter for tomorrow. It's such a critical concept that if you know, if you have a real estate portfolio, whether it's one single family home or a, you know a large size portfolio, instead of feeling dismay or instead of feeling like man I can't grow, you know, there's there's different ways that you can grow, right? You're you a child can grow taller, a child can grow stronger. Well, this year we didn't grow taller, but we grew a lot stronger. So think about what you can do to optimize and maximize the assets that you already have and get more out of what you have. That's that's technically a better investment than just buying new investments. It like pains my entrepreneur heart to say that, but that's that's the mathematical truth. So uh, think about what you can do in your own portfolio to apply those lessons. We're doing some new construction. Uh, so this is something that I'd recommend anyone kind of pay attention to. So we're getting things zoned uh, and titled. We've been working on this deal, uh, one of these deals here for quite a while, and we're going through architecture and engineering right now. Um, so the really expensive part, that can come later when interest rates go down. It takes years to get a project fully entitled. So that's something that anyone can do right now is you can, you can get a project entitled. We are testing a seedling in the greenhouse. I love the little uh, metaphor. It's winter, baby. Yeah. So um, we historically have not been very interested in short-term rentals, but we're seeing a resurgence in Rochester of patients that are visiting Mayo Clinic. Mayo announced a huge uh, $5 billion Hospital of the Future expansion. So we know that there will be more patients. Now that's a few years away, but what comes first is the construction workers that will need short and medium-term housing. So very excited to, you know, become experts at this, to spool up as many as we can, to get coaching from the best of the best, to iterate as quickly as possible. Um, so we have a, you know, a whole team that's sourcing furniture, putting it together, putting the listings together, servicing our customers, you know, a whole set of business that we did not have as recently as say three months ago. Um, and we're, you know, we're watching that revenue. Revenue is the lifeblood of any organization. So kind of thinking in our minds that this is a separate business. It's, it's not, it's part of Black Swan Living and the profits from this flow through to the assets that are owned by our funds. But thinking of it is how can we make this a very profitable, successful business, learn as much as we can so that we're ready for this next high season in say March, April, May, June, we have our super host status, our pricing dialed in, price labs, all of those things, but then really do well as workers come to Rochester to build the hospital of the future. Does this make sense to y'all how we'd want to go build like 10 of these right now when things are slow? And we have some extra time to make mistakes and make mistakes on a small scale. And then when spring comes, we're ready to go with, with all that stuff honed. And we've got some seedlings to start with. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? Absolutely. All right. Last couple of slides here. Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, all right. So what are we doing uh, to prepare for spring? Uh, we're raising a ton of money. We're going to conferences. We're raising capital. We've got uh, our wait list, uh, blackswanfund3.com. Go check it out if you'd like to put your name on our wait list. And we didn't spend a penny because we don't have any fees. So uh, most syndicators, most you know, private equity funds, they've got a litany of fees they charge, particularly acquisition fees. The most profitable day for the GP is the day that they close, regardless of whether or not they bought a good deal or not. And the fact is for, for the LPs, for, from an equity perspective, you make money when you buy. So um, we have no reason to, to, to do a thin deal or to, to do a deal just to generate fees because we don't, we don't collect those fees. We're still writing offers uh, all the time uh, we are not pencils down. So we are not I, pencils down. I don't want the lesson to be, oh, well, they're not buying, so I shouldn't be buying. We are writing offers. We're going to share some of them here. Um, you know, pencils are sharp. We're in conversation. We're you know saying, hey, I, I understand why this number doesn't make sense to you today, but you know, we all know interest rates, right? We can all Google interest rates. So you know, when something changes, we want to be your first call. We're known for closing, we're known for being easy to work with you should be doing that behavior too. If you have a goal of continuing to grow your portfolio, do not put your pencil down. Remember all the people who are putting their pencils down and let that provide you with motivation to say, hey, you know, six months ago, there might've been a hundred buyers. Well, 80 of them are out hibernating right now. There's only 20 left. So you can have more of a competitive advantage. And at the end of the day, the only way for you to know when the season has changed is for you to be outside every day. If you're huddled up in the lodge all the time and, and you uh, you only figure out at spring when you see farmer bill out on, on their tractor, uh, you're, you're late to the game and you've probably missed the biggest buying opportunity of the cycle. So you need to be out there every day. You know, here's the deal. We offered uh, 7 million seller strike was seven and a half million. We could not get a deal together. Uh, another deal, uh, you know, seller strike was 41 million. We offered 38 and a half, no deal. 
you know, we're, we're off by, you know, 20% approximately on, on many of these yields, sometimes more. That's okay. Uh, it's winter time. So you don't get discouraged about it. You just know it's part of the process. That's the season that you're in. There's two deals we're actually working on right now. I think we just lost one like in the last couple of days. There's one other one that's looking pretty good. Uh, but I'm on like my fifth no. So I've still got a lot more no's to go before we can get to a <laughs> yes. And that's that's just how it goes. And we're okay with that. Absolutely. So these are our recommendations. Again, we don't give investment advice. This is just what we're doing You know, with our portfolio. You can think of this as education or entertainment you'll find that a lot of this is pretty similar to last year. So there's very few things that are like sharp changes in the market. It's understanding the dance of the market, right? The, the clock doesn't go from six to 10. It goes from six to 6.30 to seven. So a lot of this is, is quite similar to last year with some tweaks there. Always be thinking about what is your asymmetric advantage? It is almost always something local. It's almost some, it's, you know, something about that particular market that someone can't get from a spreadsheet or a news article, find market inefficiency and fix it, survive winter, prepare for spring, martial liquidity, cash is everything right now. Cash is the lifeblood of an organization. The point of business is to keep cash on hand so that you can continue to play the game. Get out of paper assets, buy hard assets. That's, you know, sticks and bricks and dirt. Real estate is a hard asset indexed to inflation backed by paper debt. That's the most important sentence in all of capitalism. So, someone asked, when, is the st when are stocks going to surge? I don't know, and they won't. So I, we, we don't own any stocks. And historically speaking, you're rarely best served to be in the stock market. For real estate assets, of course, you know, we're, you know, big believers in a buy and hold value add model. If you can add so much value that you outpace whatever minor market fluctuations that you have, you will come out ahead. You know, Gary Keller says that real estate is a yo-yo on an escalator. Kind of visualize that in your mind. Real estate is a yo-yo on an escalator. We're not very concerned about the yo-yo. We're excited about getting as many dollars as possible onto that escalator. That's been the name of the game for the last, you know, 12 years of our investment and, and will be for the next you know, 20 to 25 years. And that time frame is just because of our biological lifespan, not because of anything you know that we think might happen in the market in say 20 to 25 years. For new construction, getting your land ready, doing your soil studies, your zoning, working with city council, all of those things can take years, right? There's one city council member missing at a meeting and boom, you have to wait till the next month. Um, so just enjoy this time. Just say, hey, now's the time to be doing these things while interest rates high and I wouldn't be actually building anyway, but I can get all of these other pieces in place. So, you know, that's what we've been excited to do. Stay cash flow positive. Always, always, always stay cash flow positive and think about what you can do to leverage the power of vertical integration. So where's the safest place to store your harvest in winter? Uh, fixed income assets have gotten absolutely hammered during this run up in interest rates. I do think interest rates are, are coming down, but it's still uh, it's still a tough time, you know, when you're dealing with inflation. Um, paper assets like stocks, uh, you know, just had a little bit of an editorial on that, uh, but they do struggle with with high inflation, high interest rates, and and just if you're looking at a you know a seven percent average annual return, uh, you know. Give us your money. We'll, we'll give you ten percent or something like. That. It's just it's not uh it's just not a great rate of return. All things considered, uh, crypto is a kind of hard asset, but man, oh man, is it unreliable. I'm a crypto person. We actually heated our house through a, a Minnesota winter with cryptocurrency mining rigs, but we've actually never made money at it on on the balance, all the different things. So it's more of a hobby, certainly not a vocation, because we've not made money at it. Um, at the end of the day, you have to be in a hard asset that's indexed to inflation, just like Elaine has said. So. Precious metals are pretty good, but they don't actually make any money. At the end of the day, it's really real estate. I mean, there's there's great alternatives out there, but it's it's at the core. And and it's just because you get the best debt there is out there, at least in the United States, you do, not not in all countries. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're at 4% or 8%, it's still amazing leverage. Um, you know, this is not exactly a groundbreaking slide here, but office isn't doing so great. I, you know, we don't recommend investing in office right now or retail or warehouses. Storage, you're getting a little warmer, but it's easy to get overbuilt, especially these days. Hospitality is actually doing pretty well these days. So I, I, you know, I'm, we're really warming up to the hospitality space. Assisted living is great if you have a way to operate it. Uh, really, that brings us down to residential rental, short-term, long-term rental. So. So things to avoid in all parts of the cycle, but particularly in winter, don't run out of cash. Don't run out of cash. Don't go pencils down. Um, someone had asked, you know, do we think flip will, will come back? I don't think so. Like there's just so much um, 
you know, the builders can't do it. Good yeah, luck flipping. If the builders can't do it and interest rates need to come down. I, I think flipping is flipping made a ton of sense in 2014, 15, 16, you know, 18, 19, even yeah. 2020. But then things just, just got too tight that if you bought it just the wrong time and you, you know, interest rate change or something, you can't sell with the profit margin. Um, avoid office, avoid retail, avoid hold periods of less than five years. That's always been true for us, but particularly now while there's this price discovery and interest rate change that will happen. Avoid build for sale. I mean, so we have personally seen, you know, multi-generational home builders like really struggle with their inventory, really watch it, mm -hmm. you know, bleed them dry of cash. So build for sale is really tough right now. We're uncertain about Airbnb. Obviously we are, you know, deeply exploring it in our market. It makes a ton of sense because of hospital of the future. But for example, we're not doing it in Tacoma because Tacoma doesn't have that driver that we believe hospital of the future will have. So we're 50, 50 on Airbnb right now. If you have any bad debt left, get rid of it. Um, if you've been holding on to you know, credit card debt or something like that, and you have an opportunity to get that into fixed rate debt, go for it. You know, don't don't punish yourself or be upset with yourself that you didn't get that fixed rate debt in you know 2020 or 2021. That ship has sailed, but lock it in now. Don't wait for rates to be low again. It could be another year or so, and you know you may save a lot of interest in that meantime. We don't necessarily think that lending will get easier when rates come down. There's so many people that want to come into the market. You know, like Nick was saying, all these institutional buyers. There's also all these first-time homeowners. So there's just many populations that are just like held back by the dam of interest rates right now. That's going to break through, and that's you know. So there's going to be more people trying to access the same lending dollars. So I don't mm -hmm. necessarily think it's going to get easier. We're spending, you know, we've always, I guess I'll you know, go to the next slide. So, so what do you do? So our timeless principles, we really believe in having a timeless investment thesis. You know, the, the third to the bottom bullet point there is that it's always been the deal plus the debt is the magic. There's not been as much focus on the debt in the last several years because it was just so gosh darn easy. I mean, you literally just called a bank and they're like, sure, 2%, no big deal, come down and sign. That's not the way anymore. It, it takes a lot of effort to get really good debt, but if you can differentiate yourself, have an asymmetric advantage by getting good debt, by having good relationships with, with bankers, and then being able to apply that good debt to deals, you'll have you know, more opportunity to create magic in your market. Some of the other things um, that we think people should be focusing on right now are making offers now, continue to be in the game, continue to talk to brokers and sellers, look for those inefficiencies where you can solve a problem. Remember, solving a problem is not always top line number. There are many other factors that go into solving a problem. There's price and terms. There's a lot of focus on price. What can you do to focus on terms to have an asymmetric advantage? Buy single family or multifamily. If you can find a great deal right now, you know we've shown that there are not enough housing units in the country. The law of supply and demand is a major law in the economy. So get yourself on the right side of that law and own and control as much of that supply as you possibly can. Warren Buffett says always buy below replacement costs. That's getting harder to do, but kind of think of that as you know a, a core tenant in your investment thesis that if you can you know buy something brand new for say 400, don't buy something used at 500 unless there's a really, 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 really compelling reason. And there's probably not, you always want to buy below replacement costs because the you know average buyer coming into that market, they're going to buy something brand new if they're able to. So buying below re replacement cost is a core part of a solid investment thesis. Of course, stay cash flow positive. You know, we can't say that enough. The temptation is getting higher as interest rates go up to say, uh, I'll figure out a way to be a little bit cash flow negative and you know those sorts of things. I do think you need to you know evaluate and ask yourself, can you be cash flow neutral or slightly cash flow positive and benefit from the other levers of real estate wealth drivers? Um, debt pay down, forced appreciation, market appreciation, and tax advantages. But by gosh, don't get yourself into you know cash flow negative. Um, you can maybe think of if you have an established portfolio, maybe you have eight houses, 15 houses, something like that, you could maybe potentially consider adding one house that's cash flow negative, but the whole portfolio is still cash flow positive. Again, that's getting a little risky, but by the time you have a portfolio, you probably are a little bit more of an experienced investor and understand the trade-offs there and kind of think of your portfolio as a whole. But in general, 
you need to be thinking about staying cash flow positive and not kind of getting lured into the temptation of, oh, I haven't closed a deal in a while. I'm feeling kind of itchy and I just, I'll just, I'll make this one work. And then you create alligators that, that eat up your cash flow. We're cautious and conservative, right? People, I think, sometimes think of us as, you know, kind of big risk takers. I'm not like a poker player, but like when we're when we're playing, we're really playing. But in general, you know, we we tend to be to be cautious and conservative. The number I got this award. Uh, this is uh, running with the bulls for the biggest risk taker. And I just chuckled when I got this award because I'm like, y'all y'all don't get us. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're we're very cautious. Um, buy things that you'll be glad to own 10 years from now, right? We all know 10 years, think about what you were doing 10 years ago, or if you have children or something in the home, right? 10 years goes by so fast. And think about what's a great piece of real estate that you're excited to own on day one. It's cash flow positive. You have an opportunity to love on it, to add value, to operate it very well. And you know that it's in the path of progress. You know that it's in a city that's growing with a strong economy, job creation. None of that has changed for us in the past decade. It's harder. There's fewer deals. It's thinner. This is the first year that we've not gotten something under contract, but all of this mm. stuff stays the same. Yeah. Yep. Our very last slide is if you want to uh, connect with us, our website is meetblackswan.com. We just had a big relaunch of our website. So if yeah. you haven't had an opportunity, yeah, head over there, poke around, talk about the history of our company. You can see all of our assets. You can see them from the resident perspective, which is pretty interesting. Like if you were, you know, looking to rent in our area, you get to see that side of the business as well. We have some pretty nice media these days. We do. Yeah. We've really worked hard on it this year, right? So that's an opportunity to optimize and maximize to, you know, spend some time and effort on marketing when other companies are cutting back their marketing dollars and their marketing um, time. We leaned into it and we said, hey, we can gobble up market share that will then become our permanent market share. Learn that from Gary Keller that, you know, that isn't an idea that we, we learned that from Tony Robbins. That isn't an idea that we, you know, came up with ourselves, but we, we put it into mm -hmm. practice. And so you can, you can see that on our website. If you want to connect with our calendar, all of those sorts of things, that's all right there at meetblackswan.com. Or if you want to come see these beautiful assets in person. Yeah. The Real Estate Real Life 2024 coming up in May. Yeah. It, we're doing it in May yeah. each year. Um, just super excited about that event. Friday night is a working time as everyone's you know, flying and driving in. You just get to meet these amazing fellow investors and chat with them and build friendships. And yeah, you're on the quick draw there. That, that link that's that's impressive. impressive. Yeah, lots of people have built you know, real friendships in, in the event. Saturday, we do real estate education all day. And then Saturday evening, we focus on legacy. So the theme of our event is secure your freedom. That's understanding how do you invest well in real estate, launch your legacy is what's the point of all this money? It's not to just have it in the bank, right? It's to live a good life. And so we focus on that Saturday evening with just a really lovely event. Um, and then on Sunday, we get into a bus and we tour the property. So it's, you know, it's unlike anything else we've ever seen in any other conference. These aren't properties that are, you know, on the market or under contract. These are properties that we own that are in various stages of renovation. If you come back each year, you get to see these properties, you know, kind of grow up. It's, it's we got to buy something so we have some rehabs to tour for the conference. Yeah. Um, and then on Monday, we have an optional VIP day where we do kind of all of that in one day where we'll, you know, look at a particular asset, do some deeper teaching, some deeper mindset stuff, continue to have that networking. Our, our event is totally unlike any other events. It's about half investors, half non-investors. So if that, if anything there sounds compelling to you, we would love to have you in Rochester. I think people really understand Black Swan when they spend a weekend with us. When you see these properties, you see the team, you see the literal lawn equipment, the snow plows, it just clicks in a way that we try our very best to deliver via Zoom, but you just get a really special experience here in Rochester. If you're interested in potentially investing with us in the future, you can add your name to the waitlist at blackswanfund3.com. Lots of questions, including some tonight about, you know, hey, any timeline on that? Any guidance you could give? I wish. I wish. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Um, I'll be honest, I'm surprised that, you know, we've not launched Fund 3 yet. We're really committed to you know, investing your dollars the same way you know, we would invest our own dollars. And right now we we haven't found a deal that's that's worthy. You know, we went yeah. through you know many of the, the offers that we have out there and you see the difference in our strike price. We're continuing to be in conversation and relationship with those people. Something will break through, interest rates will change, there are inefficiencies in the market that you know we can solve problems for sellers. We're really toying with the single family home mm -hmm. fund idea, but really want to do that cautiously and make mm -hmm. sure that we do that right. Um, so we don't have a projected timeline for Black Swan Fund 3, um, 
I think we all hope, both us and you guys, that it's you know sooner rather than we'll later. Do, we'll lose more coaching programs yeah. if we don't buy anything. We, so we, we really want to make sure that you know when we launch it, it's it's absolutely at the right time. That is everything we have for our slides. We are happy to answer the questions there. Happy to answer any other questions that come up. We'll we'll look at some of the ones that have come through. If anything's on your mind, you know, put that into chat and answer those. Rachel, do we have the date set for our January community power hour? We don't we don't have that set yet. Okay. So we'll get those dates out soon for our upcoming uh, community power hours. We'll do either January or February on AI. AI, baby. If you have any topics that you'd like to hear, please let us know. Rachel sends out a feedback survey. I personally look at every single survey that comes through. So please take just a few minutes to fill that out. Rate us on a couple of things. Drop your comments in. We've been doing this for several years now. And so it's a little hard for us to come up with new topics to talk about. But if you have something that you're really interested in, you know, drop that in there and, and we'll take that into, into consideration. Want to answer some questions for a few minutes? Sure. Uh, where did you find the dot plot? You just Google fed dot plot and it's right there on the Federal Reserve website. Yep. We talked about Or that. look it up on ChatGPT, maybe. I, I don't I know. ChatGPT is yeah. old. All right. What else? Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on medical office space? I think it's a, a pretty good one. Uh, it's it's doing way better than uh, conventional office space. And it's just intuitively something that's probably not going to go online, right? So you need something that's not going to be disrupted by AI or Amazon. I mean, we are building our entire real estate portfolio around a $4 billion hospital expansion or $5 billion which hospital is, expansion. Which is technically medical office. So we're, we're all in on $5 billion of medical office, baby. Absolutely. I'm saying baby a lot. I think looking at the questions that have come in, I think we've answered all of those. Um, did we cover why China built so many homes? Um, so people had you know some different different things there. It, it kept the economy going. The joke is that uh, America prints money while China prints houses. So this is going to sound like really crazy to an American, but what happens is the the the, the Politburo will get together and they'll say we want GDP to grow by eight percent this year, and then they just do some math and they say okay how many houses do we need to build in order to grow GDP by 8%? And then they take out debt to go build all those houses. And then there's kind of like, a, if you build it, they will come uh, until they eventually built 1 billion extra houses. So you could literally have a place for every American to live several times over. Uh, that's how crazy they ran away with this uh, concept. Um, but, but, you know, leadership, they're not, they're not fools. They, they did it for a reason. There's, there's whole ghost cities. You could probably think of those as backup, cities uh it's kind of grim but that's likely the reality of the situation um an excellent question how are we using ai now um you know lots of different ways we use chat gpt we're only just beginning to dabble a little bit in um you know making like some animations and, and those sorts of things but for chat gpt i mean you can really think of it as just like a person that you talk to it's very different than the way you interact with google i think a fun thing to do is to try not to use google at all for a week and just force yourself to get into the habit of using chat gpt it might be things like like literal uses in the last week were we were in Austin and I just talk to it. Like I talk, well, I, you know, I type it in, but I just talk to it like it's a friend. So I'll say, um, you know, we're a couple in our late thirties. We're in Austin without children. We're not super foodies, but we would like to have a romantic dinner tonight. What are the top three restaurants that you recommend and why? Like, that's a little bit different than how you might interact with Google. At Google, you might say like top you know, steakhouses in Austin or most romantic restaurants in Austin or something like that. But to give it information about yourself and the experience that you're looking for, ChatGPT then gives you back information and then you can keep talking with it. So maybe it gives you three options and you can say, great, I'm staying at this hotel, which one is closest? So again, you could do that on Google, but you're, you're moving then into Google Maps and some other things. You're having to really think about it versus just talking with it. Just like, you know, I might talk to Nick like, well, hey, you know, do you know which one is closest? Um, Maybe it's early in the evening. Okay, we've decided to go to ABC restaurant. Are there any local sites that we should see around that area? You know, a bridge or an art piece of artwork or something like that. 
does that give you kind of an example of how you can use it for just like your literally your day to day activities? Um, summarizing books is a great one. Um, synthesizing concepts. So I um, am am you know really um, influenced by Tony Robbins, Gary Keller, and Dan Sullivan. Dan Sullivan's of a of strategic coach. So I will ask Chat GPT a question like, "My company is now." at 50 employees, I have seven uh, mid-level managers. From the perspective of Tony Robbins, Gary Keller, and Dan Sullivan, what are the top three things I need to be focusing on as a business leader over the next year to grow my middle managers? Like you can't ask that of Google. You can ask it things like, how can I be a great manager? Or how do I you know, develop my staff? But you can't, you know, talk to it. Like, like I just, I just keep kind of coming back, um, to, to this idea of just, just talking with it. Um, yeah, Nick's pulling up, you know, all of the, some of the different things that, that so we've done here. sound crazy, but one of our Philippine staff, like they're not very good at creative writing. That's just a normal cultural thing. So I tell them to use chat GPT to go in and they've got this listing they need to duplicate, but with a catchy title. And so, uh, create a catchy and unique Airbnb listing title that is essential. It, like, like it just tells you exactly what you need. Or I was uh, working on a homework thing with my kindergartner uh, where, he, where she had to write down uh, fun facts about Halloween. So I just kept asking it for more fun facts. And then she uh, wrote those things down. Um, so we can do a whole, uh, a whole thing on this in, uh, you know, next month. Um, but people had some really basic questions there. Like, how do you, how do you access it? Just go to chat.openai.com. Uh, and then how do you talk to it? You use your phone. So uh, you can just use the. I, I type it in. So when I say talk to it, I just mean that like in my mind, you can't, you can talk into it, but I just type into it, but it's just that the way you think you need to like, I don't think about myself talking to Google. I search Google. I go to Google and I say, mm -hmm. give me the top 10 restaurants in Austin, Texas. But when I think about chat GPT, I think, well, what might I, you know, I, I have some good friends that live in Austin. What might I ask them as a real human being? And that's what I go to ChatGPT and say, mm -hmm. you can go to ChatGPT and say, tell me the top 10, you know, best steakhouses in Austin, but you're not going to get the, the most out of the software versus telling it a little bit about you, what you're looking for, maybe what part of town you want to do. If you want to add on a movie or a cultural event, like that's a little harder to do in Google. So that's what I mean by, by talk to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can do all kinds of very powerful things with it. We'll do a full demo. Yeah, it'll be awesome. Um, let's wrap it up so we can get home to our nanny and our hopefully sleeping children. Surely. Um, happy holidays to all of you. This is a, a wonderful time of year. It can also be a very stressful time of year with family dynamics and feeling like there's you know just so much to do and maybe a lot of comparison or other things. Our wish for you is that and I always get so choked up at the end every single month, like no matter what we're talking about, is that you it's a good problem to have. You you find an opportunity to to find peace in this season. If you have a religious tradition, you can you know find peace in that. Like really appreciate the season. If there's not a you know particular re religious tradition that you adhere to, just think about you know some of the point of winter is that hibernation feeling, is that peace feeling, is being you know with yourself in quiet and dark and just letting your mind think, letting your mind wonder and explore. This is a great time for that. Happy New Year. It's our absolute favorite time of the year. We celebrate any reason to think about starting afresh, starting anew, setting a new set of goals, recommitting to anything that's on your heart. The New Year's, you know, New Year's birthdays, academic New Year's, Chinese New Year's, you know, whatever it is, we, we celebrate them all. Um, so that, that January 1st is just such a special day. That's our parting thoughts for you for 2023. I think 2024 is going to be in a really amazing year. We're happy to you know, be in relationship with you and to guide you as much as we can with our community power hours. Real Estate at Scale is a great place to be in conversation with us and with, with each other, asking about deals, what you're seeing in the market, just staying in relationship with people between our community power hours. It's always a pleasure to serve you and to be with you. These nights are you know, some of our favorite as we prepare for them and get to you know hear from your questions and, and feel like we're all here together, just learning and growing together. So thank you so much for that. Happy holidays. Happy new year. Yep. Bye everyone.